Internet. Proceedings are taking place live on the internet and the meeting will be recorded for future viewing. It will assist the conduct of business if participants speak when invited. All participants should mute the microphones and turn off the video feed when they're not speaking. Members of the public are welcome to view the proceedings, but should not make contributions at this meeting unless invited to do so. Please remember to unmute your microphone and switch on your video feed when it is your turn to speak. Speak clearly and slowly into your microphone. Anyone wishing to speak should indicate using the raise your hand button and I would invite people to speak at the appropriate time. The raise your hand icon should also be used for assent should voting be required. I ask for everyone's patience with the use of the technology and we'll apologise in advance if we experience any unforeseen difficulties which we'll try to resolve expediently. So going into the first agenda item, are there any apologies for absence? I haven't received any leader. I think we are all here. Oh, excellent. And to report any changes in the representation of opposition group members? No, I think Not we all just turn up now, don't we? So it's... Yeah, yeah. And number three, to receive any declarations of interest under the members' code of conduct. And I, I think uh, I think Kada's getting his hand there. Kada, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, it's it's on my side. It's saying I've got technical issues, hence why I'm saying uh, it's saying my camera's not working and my microphone's not working. So if you can hear me, then obviously it is. Um, I wanted to declare an interest, obviously, in any rela uh, item related to the National Health Service, considering my employment at the local trust. Okay, that's noted. And I've seen that Kath said she doesn't have a hand icon. I could just do the hand, so we'll, I'll try and notice you. Okay, then. In, any other declarations of interest before we move on? Okay, thank you. Right then, to con agenda item four, to confirm and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 12th of February as a correct record. Okay. Kath? Can I take a matter, um, a matter arising, Councillor uh, Harley, for clarification, please? You can, yes. Thank so you. You're, so you're, you're appearing twice. Aren't you the lucky one? <laughs> well, you're, so, you're appearing on the top part of the laptop as uh, Councillor Zard in the room Woodside and then you yourself there on the bottom. <laughs> the joys it's, of technology. It's an improvement, Cadder. It's an improvement. <laughs> OK, so um, page 30, the, C33, item 7. So would it be, under this item, would it be um, an appropriate time to ask yourself for an update, please, on the financial position of VLR, given um, the press announcement that you made last week? Yeah, I can, I can do, yeah. Yeah. Okay, what I will do, I'll get a, I'll get a detailed uh, written response to you uh, to show where we are. Uh, obviously, it's been quite troubled from the moment that the LEP uh, pulled funding some time ago. Uh, they then found alternative uh, funding sources for it. We don't believe that that funding pot will be sufficient. Uh, so therefore, we're taking our chance with the government. If they want a ready-made scheme, shovel a ready scheme that is ready to go, uh, we've got guys already on site. It is new technology, leaner, more greener uh, mode of new transport. So it ticks all the boxes for government to say, look, if you, if you want these really big infrastructure projects uh, uh, and we're going to hand out cash to support them, then for me, VLR is tailor-made for it. Hence why we've made our, our bit of, you know, quite public uh, plea for the cash to uh, support that. If we can't get that funding through, and if the money isn't forthcoming from either the LEP or the CA, then obviously you're into the realms of, of, of wanting to borrow that money. And at the current in the current climate, I think that's the last thing that we, you know, we want to do, any of us. So 
Uh, yes, the Beggy Mall has gone out, but I'm confident because it's that sort of investment that they are all, you know, they're saying that this is the right type of investment. I think it's tailor made for the government to make that announcement. I think, I think, I think it's later this week. So, uh, you know, we put the, I think it's a £3.2 billion uh, figure that we put in combined from, the, you know, the LEP. Uh, the, the, the Black Country left and the combined authority together, all the other authorities working together. Uh, but I think it's a it's a scheme that's tailor made for this type of investment and announcement. But I will get you the, a more detailed um, uh, response, Kath, and possibly a briefing as well with uh, probably Jim. I'll have Jim Cunningham's on the line. You there, Jim? You want to add anything? You were there. No, I, I think that there is. we could get the um, detailed briefing prepared and uh, I know Matt has been involved in discussions over the last few days, so we could get that pulled together and get that uh, over to you for Councillor Beatty. Okay, happy Kath? Yeah. Can't see any more hands, so I'll virtually sign those minutes and if there's nothing else. Okay, thank you. Right then, agenda item five, the capital program monitoring report, pages one to 19. Any observations or questions from colleagues? Kath, uh, Kath just be, I've got Kath, Kershid, Shokat, and I think Sue, Sue Ridney. Okay, so Kath, if you, off you go first. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So my my question is around um, on uh, page one recommendations bullet point three the emergency active travel fund. So whilst I understand that we're having the money in two tranches, in the first tranche uh, is the, the two hundred thirty seven thousand, which is being used to provide uh, the metal barriers to widen pavements. Um, I know that there is a second op an opportunity from the second tranche of the government money to invest into cycle paths and walkways. And I'm looking for an assurance that is outlined in the government report that there will be a particular focus on plans in, in Dudley to concentrate on the last active mile of a person's journey. So to make sure that the cycle routes that people can cycle to and from either tram, metro, bus stop, whatever it might be, and also walking, that we make sure we put some money, we, we, have, we have plans that will um, sustain that, please. Okay, is there anybody that wants to come in and answer that specifically for Kath? I was just going to say, do you, want Aaron, to, yeah. do you want to do the other questions first in case there's any more, and I'll do them all together? Yeah, good idea. Okay, then I've got, I've got Kershid Nest. I've noticed you put your hand up, Judy. So Kershid and then Shokat. Uh, thanks, Leader. Um, just a few points. Um, first of all, I know what you've said about the BLR and the borrowing in the tricky times, and I, I share your concerns. We It is a tricky time, and we've got to be careful. Just on page four, paragraph number eight, it's, this is a crystal layer centre, and uh, you probably noted there's £200,000 added on to the, the program. Um, and obviously the basis given is that there was a the bores that need to, to be taken out and, and therefore there's going to be a future savings of £9,000 per annum. Um, of course, it's a, uh, certainly good news that, you know, we're replacing the heating, I accept that. But what I don't, I have confusion with is the fact that a lot of these programs uh, become overspent and they come, keep on coming back on the capital side. And uh, we need to be asking, you know, why wasn't this additional work um, noted at the time when the first quotation was obtained so that, you know, when we put this in the original budget plan. Um, and we need, we need to make sure this planning is carefully done and, and, and not, you know, it, it turns up in future like this, uh, it just causes more problems for all of us. Um, so we need to know that it, it, it won't happen again um, and we need to plan better in the future. Um, 
also, um, you know, as far as the, the boards are concerned, um, you know, we just need to make sure that at the moment, I understand there's a initial um, findings made that uh, the results are positive. When are we going to find out the actual results, whether there'll be a benefit in respect of what this uh, 200,000 pounds additional money is being spent on? So it'd be useful to know, because what we don't want to find out is having given the 200,000 pounds, and then we say, hang on, that was initial finding, but something else has happened and, oh, that's not feasible no, no longer. So just sort of, you know, those are the issues in respect to that. And also, what obviously, we've been the, if we do make a decision today, it will be probably made on the basis that we've been informed that there will be annual approximate saving of £9,000. How do we know in the future that there will be this savings of £9,000 in respect of fuel bills and whatever it may be? And how does that come back to us as a cabinet? So we need to be making sure that the information that is provided to us is accurate and is, is with merit and not just a sort of a, on, you know, a guest job, really. Uh, there's a few other things. Do you want me to carry on, Councillor Harley? Sorry, I can't hear you. You've disappeared. Patrick, put your mic on, please. You, you wish. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, no, 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 carry on because it's really quite difficult to try and keep track of everybody who, who wants to speak. So it's an absolute nightmare this is. So please carry on. We'll, we'll get through to it together. Thank you. Page number five, paragraph nine. Bunny Hill Heritage Action, Action Zone. Uh, again, this is an excellent news um, for Bridey Hill. The residents um, have seen the high street and many buildings around it deteriorating over the years. This funding will you know, definitely help to improve the area and bring back into use many cold, closed and derelict, derelict buildings. The report also sets out that the, there's a program which is going to be divided into three strands, uh, once for physical works, once for the, uh, the cultural activities and events, and the final one is a community engagement. All three are important, I accept that. Um, but I'm just wondering if you at this stage or anyone is able to confirm what the split in amount would be in this, each one, because as far as I'm aware, what are the community engagement workers on this application to make funding? What we do is duplicating money, and you know that we can be spent on something that's going to make a bigger impact for the local area. Um, at that point, we move on to the next one, please. Yep. Okay. The next one is page six, paragraph eleven. Saltwells Nature Reserve and Warden Bay. Again, I mean, I noted this more prudent borrowing. It's I referred to your comments, what you said about the VLR, and we've got to watch what we're doing. Um, so my real issues are that the additional capital programs, there's too many of these, and we need to make sure that we're getting value for money. Um, and, uh, you know, these items need to be, um, you know, quotations need to be properly made in the first place. Um, and the other main issue is that what we're saying is that there will be a, uh, a debt charge in respect of this additional borrowing, and that debt charge will be paid from further green care savings. Now, that particular service is already on, running on the bones, and, you know, any more cuts on that side was, is going to have a really bad impact. And, and, you know, I'm talking about the whole borough, not just my area, but I think it affects all of us. So we just need to be careful that lots of borrowing, lots of debt charges, but then would we be, and, and if it's being paid out of the service, uh, service savings, in particular that one, I'd be concerned about it and hope that you are too. The next one would be again on page six, paragraph 12, interchange and metro land acquisition for highways works. Now, a note that uh, the third party land acquisitions is estimated at 1.5 million. Now, I'm just wondering, does that include the, you know, the farm food building that we had there? Does that include trying to get that back and making that as part of the, um, the, um, the interchange or not? Secondly, on page 17, it's connected to this. Um, it's under the heading of Dudley Interchange again. A total further sum of 2.1 million has been approved 
to support third party land acquisitions associated with the delivery of interchange. Now, is that the same amount that we're talking about for the same things or is that something different? And if it is different, then, you know, why is it, what's this extra £600,000 that's been referred to? Because we, we're setting aside 2.1 million, but we're saying that land acquisition is going to be 1.5 million. Um, if I can move on to the next one, uh, leader. Page seven, paragraph 14. Funding of family centre improvements and um, um, Sycamore Adventures soft, uh, uh, soft scheme. I mean, this is this is great news. Obviously, it's it's good to hear that we are spending money on the family centre improvements. But I'm just a bit cautious in respect to the eighty thousand pounds capital program for refurbishment of unused catering kitchen at the established family centre, and. And all we're doing is creating that um, an office and a practitioner space and eighty thousand pounds. Are we being ripped off there, or is this value for money, or what's going on? And I think we just need to be mindful of how these figures that are presented before us, in particular for the for the capital sums, that they are realistic and reasonable. Uh, that's all for time being, please. Okay, cheers, Kershid. If you get at the conclusion of it, if you can email those questions through with the detail, because it, it's at, at some point it was quite difficult to hear. So the sound sounds absolutely awful. I don't know what it was like for other people. Uh, and then obviously we can get you the right briefings and get you the right answers, because that that was quite detailed. And, and we could I couldn't pick it all up here. Um, I think I've got. Anybody want to come back on Kirsch's questions? The Matt there or Ian? Ian, I think Ian put his hand up. Was that to answer Kirsch's questions? You got your mic muted? I can come in there, uh, Lena, if you need me. Yeah, please. Just, just, just a couple of issues. Uh, I take Councillor Ahmed's point in relation to the leisure centre, uh, but the original feasibility work was undertaken uh, an awful long time ago, uh, and the world's changed quite considerably since then. Um, a, a lot of the equipment uh, for that scheme will be coming from Germany, and the, the, the exchange rate's been quite volatile. Uh, we have had uh, issues with the boreholes, but um, we're now at the, uh, at the design stage, so any information we've got is robust uh, and we're in a good position to move forward. So we can move forward with uh, with confidence in terms of uh, what we're trying to technically achieve. And we're also trying to merge that with the uh, the wider leisure centre project. Um, so uh, it will be linked in with the refurbishment of the building. Uh, so hopefully we'll have two good quality uh, refurbishments and one new leisure centre to look forward to. Uh, in the coming years. So that's where we are with that. In terms of uh, the um, the warden's base at Salt Wells, um, hopefully um, we've been restricted up to now in terms of the work that we can do at Salt Wells. We work very closely with the private sector. Last time I was up there, there were a bunch of accountants from Ernst & Young uh, doing some, uh, some training, some team building exercises uh, out on the reserve. Uh, and, and there's considerable demand for that sort of work there. So hopefully, once we get the, uh, the centre up and running, then there will be an income stream which will help alleviate uh, any additional uh, cost in terms of uh, revenue uh, contribution towards, uh, towards capital. So uh, I take the point, and it's a good point that Council are made, are been made in relation to green care and the budget restrictions, but hopefully we can, uh, we can work together and, uh, and cushion that blow. Thank you, Leader. Thank, thank you for that, Matt. I've got Karen and Jim Cunningham. Was that to answer some of Kershaw's uh, points? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it, it, was, it was a bit of, a bit of Kershaw, actually. Um, yeah. So I know you, you said you were concerned about um, potential cuts to green care. And I think the way that's worded, um, it, it probably needs a little more explanation. So what you've also got to consider 
is is the fact that the staff that are going to be working there will be saving on on traveling time because the staff will actually be based at salt wells so um will there'll be improved productivity because they haven't got to go from a to b um and there also will be the facilities on site for for them to be able to use um and the equipment obviously will be saving in fuel so although you know when you look at green care savings I think you need to look at it into in terms of what we'll actually be delivering in salt wells. So it's it's actually the majority would be the staff um, and the productivity at salt wells because of this new warden base. And obviously the work has started today. The diggers are on site. Um, so and then in terms of the cost, from my point of view, that that cost it was costed some time ago. So you know um, things change as we all know. But in terms of green care savings, you know I would be the first one to be banging my drum if we were going, if we were if we were looking to stop things rather than um, progress and, and improve things. So it's mainly about the travelling time, um, the improvements in productivity, the fact that everything will be based there and they won't have to move from A to B just to start work or fuel, you know, travelling everywhere. So that was just my comment on Kershaw. Thank you. OK, and then I think it was Jim. You got your hand raised. Yes, it was just a, a, a we can get that note prepared for a board council, Ahmed, but in terms of the, the arithmetic between the two sets of figures, the 2.1 referred to later in the report includes the 1.5 million. The, the 600,000 on top of the 1.5 is for the acquisition and a demolition of the building we refer to as the photographic studio, which potentially can uh, can go some way to uh, addressing the impact of the, the metro as it comes through um, that part of Dudley Town Centre on the mosque. Um, so that, that's the that's the, 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 the arithmetic on that one, but we can get that full of note together for you. Okay, super. I've got Councillor Angus Lee, is that in relation to some of the questions asked? Can you no? hear me? Come on, you gotta get in quick. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm just coming, coming back, just been looking at my notes from the regeneration meeting we had last Monday, coming back on uh, Councillor Baton's question about the cycle paths. And I raise this with uh, Helen's team, really coming from an angle of connectivity between towns, uh, not only for commuting, but for the leisure purposes as well. And he explained that uh, canal pathways come into this and they are, they have a programme to get cycle paths and walkways. But he made the point about the metro stations and that every metro station would have a cycle path from the you know the inclusive corridor so it would be very easy for commuters to get to the station not having to drive so i hope that helps yep cheers angus thank you okay then the next person i've got holding the hand first was shellcat yeah yeah thanks uh leader can everyone hear me Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you and good to see uh, everyone. Uh, my question are in relation to the leisure centres on page 17. So first of all, I welcome the new leisure centre in, in St Thomas's Ward, uh, which uh, on which the work, uh, the construction work has started. So it, it's really good news and it's taking up uh, shape really quickly. Um, but um, I think there's two things here. If, if you recall before Christmas, um, a couple of uh, cabinet meetings, we've had discussions in relation to facilities, health facilities, which could also be part of that. And the important that we need to take that uh, work now and to have some serious discussions with our partners, the CCG and uh, the Healthcare Trust. And I've got a copy of an email here, which uh, our group leader sent to yourself, Patrick, on the 9th of December. Uh, where both of you've ha had a, uh, a amicable meeting and uh, and I think what you said is that you were going to have an independent person to review the leisure centre model in Dudley, A, to look at 24-7 model, but also look at the joint health and leisure facility, uh, looking at um, to agree with local GPs and obviously, like I said, other partners. Um, and um, I think... Um, you know, th this uh, feedback or 
report was supposed to be back with us early in January. And I'm a little kind of a little concerned that the work is developing rapidly on the current leisure, uh, the new leisure centre, but we've had nothing concrete from our health partners about uh, you know putting this facility th there because these opportunities come once in a very long time, and if we miss the opportunity now, then we're not going to get another opportunity. So that's one question, and my second question is in relation to that paragraph. It says cost certainty will be known for Hales Owen and Crystal Leisure Centres. And I just want to know whether you uh, know of those cost certainties, um, because according to that paragraph, uh, it says that you will know that soon. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, just on the leisure centres, um, I think, you know, we, we, can't, we can't keep talking forever and ever and ever. And the problem we're dealing with partners is, if they're not going at the same pace we are, then I'm sorry, we are not holding back. Uh, it, 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 we have talked about this now for, for, for years, and we just need to get on with the project, delivering a brand new leisure centre uh, that will be fit for the 21st century for our residents. Re regards to the East Average and Hal's Owen costs, they're currently being driven down. We know they're being driven down, uh, and we'll be in a position sh soon to maybe go to the next phase. So we'll know what we're going to put in there, what we're not going to put in there. And, it, and again, it will come down to cost. And it's important. We've already had members talking about this tonight. It's important that that cost envelope doesn't balloon out of all proportion. You know, eventually you have to keep a grip on it. I would say that we've got a good track record in Dudley across all administrations delivering key projects on time and within budget. I mean, the one that's in progress at the moment, which is the Metro Retaining Wall, been completed and it's coming at £700,000 under budget, which is fantastic. So, so we've got a good track record at getting these projects done. Uh, does Matt want to come in with a bit more detail on the legislative centres for Councillor Ali? Yes. Thank you, thank you, Leader. Where we are at the moment, uh, we're um, as as the leader rightly stated, we're uh, we're in uh, negotiations with the Alliance Leisure, uh, driving the uh, the costs down on uh, both refurbishment uh, projects. Um, we have um, we have a budget of um, thirteen point one uh, million that we're uh, we're, uh, we're we're determined to adhere to. Um, what we want to do is maximise footfall uh, to ensure that uh, you know we do get that leisure uh, offer and we generate more income. But at the same time, it's a balance because uh, both, as you, you'll all appreciate, both leisure centres have seen better days in terms of plant and equipment. So what we don't want to do, we, we, we don't want to uh, do a makeover, for want of a better expression, only to find that the boiler is about to blow up and all the wiring shot. It's just getting that balance right where we've got a sustainable solution where we don't really have to do any major works for the next 15 years, but we've got an offer that will actually attract more people into the leisure centres, improve income, and they'll actually be attractive and places where, um, where people want to go. I mean, obviously, post-COVID, we've got some concerns in relation to um, the, the, the actual reaction to... Um, uh, leisure and uh, just what the uh, leisure market will uh, will look like, um, but we remain confident that we can uh, deliver and we can uh, deliver uh, on budget. But the negotiations continue, as the leader said, and we're hopefully uh, going to conclude uh, towards the end of July when we'll be in a position to meet uh, the uh, the deadlines that were set uh, some time ago uh, around the Commonwealth Games. Okay, thanks, Matt. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute, Councillor Alec. Yeah, thank you. I've got a, the list is getting longer. Uh, very quick point, then, Councillor. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, leader. And uh, I don't disagree with you in terms of cracking on with with the work, and that needs to be done. But I think uh, what I'm, you know, you haven't answered my question. And my question was: Has has the health partners been approached? And in, you know, in particular, this independent person who was going to do this review, has that taken place? You know, and if, if, if those approaches have taken place and you've approached health and they haven't come back, then I can understand. But if they haven't been approached, that I think that's what I want to know. Have they been approached uh, or, or not? And have they come back with any response or not? 
I, I think quite quickly, yeah, we have approached other partners. Uh, I don't believe that they do want to uh, do business with ourselves on this particular model. So, so we have approached them, but we've not got the answer that we, we wish for. Okay, um, and if, I think if Matt arranges a briefing for you, he can probably bring you fully up to speed on that. Okay, the next one I had was Councillor Sue Ridney. You there, Sue? Yes, thank you, Leader. Thank you. Um, I, I'm referencing page seven. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I think is really good. The fact that, we've, uh, that we are, are improving the two youth centres that we have left. I would like to add a note of warning to this. In everything that's gone on during COVID and, and all the paperwork that we've seen, the investigations, I do think that we are going to, in the future, need to make further investment in youth services because I think that is going to be something that we will need to help support our young people when this period is over and into the coming years. Um, also, um, very pleased to see the... the um, the money going into the Sycamore Adventure Centre, which I think again is going to be needed, certainly in the coming months, to help with the health and well-being of our young people. Um, my concern, my question, if you like, is I notice all of these projects and, and including Corbyn Road overspend is being funded from the uncommitted 14 to 19 diplomas and SEN and Disabilities Capital uh, capital grant balances. Can I ask the value of that budget and and that was obviously uncommitted and it, and what exactly? Why didn't we spend it? Especially with all the SEN problems that we've had in the last twelve months. Cheers, Sue. Thank you. Have we got Kath or Ruth on here that can answer that question from Sue? Okay, Ruth, you got your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Yeah, the way. Um, hi, Sue. What I'll do is I'll get Kath to do you a, a detailed report and we can go through it together. Is that okay? Because I absolutely agree with you. We do need to be looking at how we're supporting the children through the next, which, as you know, we're doing with the summer schools and everything anyway. And the government's just announced um, a whole load of extra funding for, for sports, for PE and schools and everything as well. So obviously, because it's moving so rapidly, we need to get things uh, try. You know, we just get it all sorted, and then it changes again. So, but I'll get a detailed response from Kath around that particular question. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Right, is that it, Sue? Okay. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Leader. Um, my, my questions relate to Briley Hill Heritage Action Zone, and I won't repeat the questions that uh, Councillor Armour has already asked about that, relating to the, uh, the three complementary strands of the programme. What I would say, though, that is relevant to the question that I'm going to put is, in respect of B and C, cultural activities and events, and the community engagement programme, there is already some good work happening there, uh, being delivered there by the Briley Hill Community Forum, and that's not to be confused with the Briley Hill and Brockmore and Pennet Community Forum, of course. But the Briley Hill Community Forum includes councillors, traders, representatives of the community, Briley Hill Civic, Civic Society, and they already have a great deal of involvement in uh, with council officers um, in staging the Briley Hill uh, Heritage uh, Day and the Briar, the Briar Fair. Now, one of the concerns that's been raised with me uh, about uh, the funding, while it is very well, it's really important to sort of plea, really, to the council that they don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to setting up a mechanism by which the funding is uh, determined, is, is, is spent, and by which the community is engaged. There are already good mechanisms in place which can be built on. There isn't a need to recreate. A reinvent the wheel with another consultation group or a committee made up of officers that just comes in, does the work and then leave. There is already something living and breathing that does a lot of work already in, 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 in Briley Hill uh, on the high street. Uh, notwithstanding saying that, obviously the funding is, is welcomed by all. The second question I'd like to ask is a plea for some sort of timeline giving dates, expected dates of what uh, and when things are going to happen. 
from the appointment of the project manager all the way through to when the projects can be delivered, uh, what the what plan B is if plan A doesn't isn't delivered, for example, with the private sector funding and dates giving the detail that would really be helpful in giving people who are part of that uh, those existing consultation mechanisms and some confidence that the, the project will be delivered. And thirdly, and this is a slightly separate point from the agenda item, but because I have referred to it, Brockmore and Pensnet and Briley Hill Community Forum and the other community fora, I notice they're not in the programme of meetings. Now I'm concerned about how long it's going to be before those mechanisms can be up and running again because they do still have a community development role. They can still agree uh, funding applications. We can't obviously scrutinise and see those applicants in person to ask them questions about their bid, but that side of the operation can carry on. But I am concerned in the longer term of not having, having uh, committees like the Community Forum, which do look at place-related development issues and opportunities. So three questions there, Chair. Muted Sorry, Leeds, you're on mute. All I can say is, God, old David Stanley at the end of July. <laughs> You've got to manage a meeting like this. Um, have we got Helen or anybody from Region to answer Judy's questions? No. Through you, Leader, oh, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll ensure that uh, Councillor Foster gets an update in relation to the uh, the timeline. And uh, in terms of engaging the community, uh, I, you know, I think she's absolutely right. There, uh, there is a vibrant uh, civic society um, uh, or ready-made group there that I'm sure we could uh, we could tap into. Yeah, I mean. I know the former leader of the council, Tim Sunter, is still very much heavily involved in, in that in that work. And I know Tim has been involved in, in, in some of these projects, plus the fact that we've got the people's panel. So again, lots of things to tap into to make sure that we involve local community. But the points are well made. And yes, we should be having that consultation and presentations with the relevant community forums. So no, absolutely right. Yeah. Can I get back to you on that? You can, you can. The community forums, what's the future of those? They're not, I haven't seen any dates in the draft programme of meetings. What's going to happen? Well, we're not planning to scrap them, but at the moment, I think because of because of COVID and some of the restrictions, I think we'd be pretty foolish to put some of those in the diary. We can just about get by having our meetings by doing it this way. Yeah. But I think we put dates in the diary, yeah. but, but we're still planning to have them, Judy. Yeah, I'm just wondering what the alternative options are, because I know there are some legal issues as well as safety issues yeah. holding them. I'm just wondering what the options are so that we don't, that, so that there isn't a vacuum with place-related uh, yeah, yeah. development. Yeah. No, good point. I think I've got Karen with a hand up and also Angus. Yeah, I was just, I was just about commenting on, on what Judy was saying. Um, obviously, if people have got applications that they want to put forward to the community forum, there's nothing wrong, nothing stopping them still doing that, as far as I can see. <clears throat> and then obviously, you know, that can be discussed between the, the members on that particular forum and agreed, because that's how we've done emergency applications in the past. So I can't see any problem, me personally, with applications Wait. still being put forward. In my question, Councillor Shakespeare, through you, Leader, I did actually raise the point that it is possible still to do that, and we are doing that on community forums, but we're not doing other work. Okay. Can I point, point taken? I think I've got Angus and then I've got Kath. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Another, another point that came out of the region meeting, and Helen made this point, and she's particularly keen um, to really... Uh, get the community to help influence the development of the realm, uh, which is all you know, making the place look nice, but also the various activities, get activities going in these places. 
Uh, and she made the point there's 126,000 pounds still sitting in the community forums. So that's money that could be uh, well spent towards it. And I would suggest um, Councillor Baton, I think you're on, the, you're on that meeting as well. And maybe um, you and Judy could get together because uh, I think you'll find Helen, Helen Martin very um, keen to get involved, get the communities involved in what she's doing, what the regeneration team are doing. Okay. Okay, thank you. Kath? Thanks, Leader. Um, so my next question relates to page six, item 12, the interchange. So if we take the final paragraph and the last two sentences. So alongside the combined authority bid, other potential funding opportunities are being explored. Is that, again, a, rel a, a hopeful reliance on um, the 3.2 billion that has gone in from the combined authority to meet that shortfall. And then the final statement, if we could have um, some clarity from officers, please, on any acquisition would be at risk pending external funding confirmation and where that leaves us. Um, and just a general um, plea really, or point that I'd like to raise, Obviously, work is underway on many of these projects in different forms, so at different stages of the projects. Can I have assurances that we have at every stage tied in a percentages of social value to our contracts? So we have an understanding, particularly in the current climate that we're going to face of going into large job losses. How many, what's the percentage of local people are we taking on with each of our contracts please okay so anybody from region matt or jim want to come back on that point that Kath's made yeah yeah <clears throat> oh, sorry yeah. just trying to note them down here uh, Councillor Baton. Um, so in terms of the, the, the question about funding, well, the, question, the overall question about funding is that we as officers are taking every opportunity to ensure that Dudley projects are played into the various funding streams which are emerging, whether that be the combined authority, the LET, or the emerging economic recovery funds, such as the latest letter from uh, the Secretary of State for uh, MHCLG. So it's incumbent on us to make sure that Dudley projects are, are cited in all of those. So there may, there may, there may well be that we're, in, for example, around the interchange, we've got, we're, we're in negotiations and discussions with the CEA, we're in those negotiations and discussions with the LET, and we're also uh, part of that funding bid that uh, you referred to earlier of the, the collective 3.2 billion. And I think that you would expect us to, to, to do that and take those opportunities. In terms of your comment about the funding being at risk, in, in terms of the interchange, what, what we asked for authority was to potentially acquire some of the buildings early and we needed the money to do that and that way there would be an overall saving. The, the, the funding that we spend on that would be, would be included in any application that we make. So we've accounted for it in that. But obviously, you know, if we, build, if we buy the building and then we don't get the money, then the funding is at, the, 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 the funding's at risk. So that, that's the, the, we're, we're taking every opportunity we can to, to, to secure the uh, the funding that required for all of these projects and to minimise the risk exposure to the council as we do that. And a, in terms of the wider question about community benefit, yes, that we are, we, we are we're, we're trying to make sure that all external partners uh, are uh, in, embodying social value in the in the the, the, uh, the procurement of the works that they're doing. And they, they, we know that the Metro are doing that, and we you know as well that we have established an inclusive growth corridor. You know because you know from my own personal perspective, there's you know if the Metro comes through and no local people win jobs or and all this investment place place and local people don't benefit, then then we're not doing what we should be doing. So we we are fully committed to making sure that uh, the local residents benefit from the economic activity that's taking place. You're on mute. Oh, no. 
perhaps then as part of our regular briefings, um, we could actually have kind of headline figures for each of the contracts that are being given out as to what those figures um, actually are in, in reality, if that's OK. So I think I think Simon Phipps has pressed his button, so I think that's probably to do with that very point. Am I right, Simon? Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah. on the point just about um, social value and engaging local businesses, um, it is really important, uh, e you know, even more so now, but of course it was beforehand. Um, one of um, the administration's priorities uh, has been over the last um, 12, longer now, 12 to 15 months, has been to make sure that we can do business with local businesses much easier. So part of that work was to simplify the way that our contracts work and make it more appealing for local businesses to actually apply and do business with us. And then also as part of that, it's been about engaging with businesses, having good relationships with business groups. Um, we held quite a few open days um, over the last few years that have been headed up by the procurement and commercial team and trying to make sure that we get the opportunities out there to local people so they know that they can you know, apply for these sorts of contracts. That has also been um, worked on by the Corporate Scrutiny Committee, who have had um, a really good involvement in terms of developing that piece of work. And thanks to that committee, there's going to be, I think, in future when we get round to them, um, another thing about the community forums, uh, work with possibly the community forums on trying to further engage with local businesses on a ward level as well. Um, so that's one side of things in terms of making sure there's engagement with the businesses, but also for the social value as part of the tender itself, that is something that is required in, in I would say, pretty much all of our um, tenders when you go through a tender process. There will be a percentage assigned to the social value element of the contract when deciding who it's going to be awarded to. Um, and tenders will need to make sure that they perform well in the social value element to form their overall bid. Um, otherwise, it's unlikely that they will get the business from us. So some examples of what they can do is investing in the local area, hiring apprentices and local people, buying in the local supply chain. And also there's some things that you wouldn't necessarily expect, but are really, really simple that some businesses can do to uh, kind of give us a little bit of social value in the borough. And I don't know if this is the case or not, but I wouldn't be surprised if um, when we talked about earlier, one of the accountancy firms was doing some uh, work in the Saltwells Nature Reserve. Um, I've seen uh, issues in the past, uh, not issues, seen examples in the past where some one of their contractors has actually paid for some works in the Saltwells Nature Reserve and, and all that sort of stuff as well. So that has um, that has been in there. And it's uh, it's also important that we make sure that that is monitored and that um, you know the big contracts and the procurements are actually challenge to ensure that they do deliver on social value. So uh, a new a group, an officers group has been set up to do that, which is called the Procurement Management Group, which sort of goes through all these sorts of tenders with a, with a fine tooth comb as well to try and make sure we're getting that value. Um, so that's kind of a high level uh, overview on what we do currently. Um, and of course, happy to discuss outside the meeting if there's anything further. OK, thank you, Simon. I've got Karen who got a hand up. Is that on this same issue? Well, no, I'm just very conscious. I still haven't answered Kat's first question. I just thought Sorry. there might be some other ones um, around that. And to be quite honest, I can't remember the full question. I know we sent some information to Angus about the cycle routes, but just if I can just go back on, are you OK with that leader? If I just yeah. go back to the Emergency Act of and which is what you were discussing, Cathy. Um, obviously, you know, the, 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 the tranche one, that was all um, temporary measures that we had to get in place for three months, which you're aware of with the high streets and um, and all that sort of thing. And I'm looking at um, cycle storage as well as part of the um, temporary measures, because one of the things I'm particularly keen on is the fact that, you know, a lot of people are cycling at the moment, but they when they get to, from A to B, there's nowhere there for them to actually store their bike. So they can't actually enjoy either the town centres or the parks, etc. So that was something that I put in as part of the um, tranche one. And hopefully that will be um, active, that will be live very soon. And then in terms of tranche two, and obviously tranche one is confirmed, we know the figures and everything. But in terms of, of tranche two, um, 
we this is an early indication of the amount of money that we're going to get and and I'm, I'm sure we will but you know this is we haven't actually received the money yet um but at on tranche two a lot of that will be um looking at um some of the existing temporary measures that we may want to make more permanent um and obviously i've um i've written to all the businesses which well, well I, i'm in the process at the moment um, in the town centres. I think we, we're doing Starbridge this week and then we'll be moving around and obviously the encouraging the traders to actually um, fill out a survey, come back and let us know their thoughts as well. Um, so that's part of it. And then I think, if I can remember correctly now, because it was at the beginning, um, it was about the, um, the, the key cycle corridors. Is that what you were asking about? Yeah. So um, Angus has already had a list and I'm quite happy to share that with you. Um, obviously, that we, we already had a list of um, key cycle corridors that we were keen to progress anyway, and that was subject to funding streams, some of which um, had already been allocated in principle. Um, so what, we, what we're doing is we're, we're putting that in as also as part of tranche two and hopefully that some of those um we sort of categorize them you know green amber red so but we're hoping that some of those um that we already want um will will go in as part of of the tranche two bid so we're just waiting to see that if, if we can get four out of you know four of them done or or more that would be absolutely wonderful because that's something we've already um been looking into anyway it was just a, a matter of finding the funding stream so, um, and I know that the Transforming Cities Fund, obviously, which has been mentioned early, earlier for the Metro Corridor, we were hoping to go that way. But if we can get some of them through the um, through the Active Travel Fund tranche too, that would be really good because obviously we can do it sooner, which would be, be excellent. I'm sure you'd agree. Thanks. Hopefully, I've answered it all, Kat. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Karen, for that. Okay, moving on. I've got Kieran. Thanks, Leader. Um, yeah, just a just a few. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, just a few questions. Um, firstly, um, obviously, we don't want to labour the point too much, but it's in my ward, um, so I just want to welcome the investment in Sycamore Adventure um, as well. We, you know, myself and Adam um, do a lot of work with them, as do uh, other councillors in the in in the ward in Castle and Priory as well. Um, so I think that will make a big difference, and I, I think, as, as Sue said, it's going to it's going to be a big challenge for a lot of young people coming out the other side of the current crisis. It's going to have a big impact on their mental health, um, and, and the work that they do at the Sycamore Centre is really important. So I'm, I'm, I think that's a great, you know, great bit of investment. Um, I also agree with um, what's been said uh, by Cathy and, and and obviously the answer from Simon as well in terms of social value from you know procurement point of view in terms of my shadow brief at the minute. I think. Moving out of the current crisis, the sort of impact on the economy is going to be quite severe. And, and anything that we can do as a council to, you know, make sure that local companies um, are being used through that procurement process and, you know, sort of really helping local people out with jobs is going to be key. Um, the, the, the big question that I wanted to ask was your point on, on VLR. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a massive piece of regeneration down there that links in with, you know, the Institute of Technology and how the university um, and other things that are going on down there. Now, obviously, if we don't get the funds from the government, which um, hopefully we will, given that, um, you know, Boris was was here recently and, um, you know, I'm sure the opportunity was taken to, to, to raise the issue. Um, if we didn't get the money, though, and I know that you're quite worried about borrowing at the minute in terms of uh, for that particular project because of you know what what you've said about borrowing what is the plan for that site i mean you know when i when i was in that brief i was very keen to try and look at alternatives for that site so have we has the council or officers done any work in terms of alternatives that might be eligible for funding that vlr isn't in terms of green technologies or autonomous vehicles it, it, things like that so, because obviously it's a massive piece of regeneration, it's massively important to the economy and it's right on the entrance to Dudley. So I just wondered what the plan was if we didn't get the funding and you were, you know, sort of worried about borrowing, as, as you said in your early answer. Thanks, Leader. Th thanks, Kieran, for that. Um, put simply, no, there aren't any other plans. Um, we believe that VLR is a game changer. It's cutting edge technologies, new technology, new means of transport. 
A VMR is a fraction of the cost of the traditional metro. So unlike what we see now in Dudley, where it's a nightmare if you're trying to get through because of all the road works and you can't have, you know, 800 million pounds worth of investment and not have, you know, diversions. But with the VLR, we don't have to do this because you don't have to disturb the, 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 the waterworks and the electrical and the, and the gas appliances. You don't have to mess with those with VLR. So it's cheaper, it's more efficient, it can be done at a fraction of the cost. Um, it has to work. You know, I would prefer not to borrow that money, but it's there if we have to. And let's hope that we don't have to. And, you know, the government are, are, are good to their word and they want to back these new initiatives. You know, we talk about the green agenda, which we've got a bit later on on the agenda. Again, VLR ticks that box. So at the moment, no, because we think it is such an important project, not just for Dudley, but also for the wider black country and the, and, and, and the wider West Midlands. And, and 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 we're doing this in partnership also obviously with commentary you know and it, i think it's a it's, it's a it's a massive game changer for us so it, it has it has to work uh, hope that's answered your question but uh, okay then uh, the next one oh, no one else got their hands up to come back on that no okay next one oh, is a uh, it is a uh, cada it's been a long time i know but we've slowly but surely got through all the questions Cada, you were next Yes, no, no, that's fine. I'm a patient man, Councillor Harney. Um, and uh, <laughs> to be on this uh, this format. Well, uh, I think it'll be interesting how the uh, full council goes on the end on how this is going. A couple of points, really. Um, I, I'd like to make the first three or four points, and I know they're in um, in motion for a fully explained answer, but I'd like uh, these to be added so I can yeah. get the more enhanced and then I've really got one question so in terms of um, I'm really concerned about what Councillor Buttery said about um, SEN um, the question here is if I understood what Councillor Ridley, Ridney said she said that it appears that some uncommitted SEN monies has now been used for a project that it wasn't set out to be used for um, so we need an explanation, really, of what that means for SEN children. Uh, we didn't need the um, whatever councillor uh, Buttery promised to give us. We just need to know what happened. And if she's got plans because there is new money coming for SEN children, we ought to know about that too. So I just wanted that to be noted for a for a detailed response. Um, there's a there's a question also on the same area, par paragraph 14. I think we, we probably want to understand why converting a kitchen to an office costs £80,000. I'm surprised. I mean, I can't see people here, but in these circumstances, Councillor Kesey is usually jumping up and down, um, you know, giving us lectures on uh, better value for money. And, and, and it's a shame I can't see him. I bet you he is jumping up and down about this £80,000 um, for a, a kitchen that's going to be converted to uh, an office. So now... We probably just need to understand, is this going to be something that we don't understand? Um, is, is it a sensory room or is it just a, a, you know, a normal office accommodation? Because it seems quite a lot of money, really, for a simple conversion. Um, and then a little bit around what Council Ali was saying, and I, I had declared my interest, and I don't know how good technology is, and I'd like to re-declare it in case it wasn't heard. Um, I'm not just talking about health partners. I'm talking about, you know, our third sector partners and, and you know, maybe other partners in here. But there was a scheduled report that the chief executive said that he was going to provide us, which was what level of consultation? Because the one I was keen on was the 24-7 opening. And I think we were, were advised that that wasn't going to happen with the leisure centre. So, you know, whatever is the plan, is the plan and i suspect some thorough work has gone into it but we just need to understand it, what it is uh, were the partners approached because um i think we were all very concerned concerned that we were advised that the partners that had been approached but there was no evidence for it and then the 24 7. now the question coming back to the question so my question is paragraph six, and I would like it explained to me what this means, because what it's saying here on paragraph six is 
There's a number of projects that are under review pending consideration of working practices and the council's financial position in light of COVID. I'd like to know, is there something that is planned on this capital programme that won't occur in the future? Um, what does that paragraph actually mean? Because I looked at uh, Appendix B, which it refers me to, but there's no detail behind there around what's going to be in, what's going to be out. If, if something's coming off this program or is prioritised, you know, could we just understand what that is? That was it. OK, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Kada. As far as I'm aware, uh, none of the projects are coming off the uh, program. Uh, and obviously we, we want to fulfil uh, our, our commitments to deliver one of our really key projects. As I said, the, the BLI is a game changer. That has to happen. Come what may, we, we, we have to deliver that. So I don't envisage these, any of these projects uh, being deleted from the programme, if that answers your question. I can't give a clearer commitment than that. But can uh, I just come in just quickly? Just and then yeah. I've got Ruth with, with a hand up to answer you really, point two. Yeah, I mean, I don't really need an answer from Ruth. I just need it sent to me. Um, okay. So, because um, in the interest of time, really, um, what, I, what I was going to say is, can if that paragraph isn't correct, that there is no capital program under review uh, as that paragraph details can we just have it written out by somebody that says that paragraph doesn't make sense in, in, fa in fairness to the people who wrote this report i think with everything that's gone on uh, where we've clearly spent far more than what's been awarded to us even though the award from central government was generous uh, we've still exceeded what they've given us to deal with covid uh, and I and I think it's just sensible to, to note that, you know, our current position is not where it was uh, pre-March. So I think we, we have to note that. But you're right, there needs to be more detail behind that paragraph. So we'll, we'll get the detail for you. OK, Ruth, did you want to come in or move on? We could move. We could move on if you like, because I'd already answered yeah, the question for Sue. Okay. So you know, I'll set, make sure councillors are to get to copy as well. That's fine. Okay, brilliant. Okay, the next one on the list was John Councillor Martin. You there, John? Are you there? I am here now, Councillor Harley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, right, OK. <laughs> Good to see everyone and I uh, hope everyone's um, staying, staying safe and well. So my question is about um, the uh, redevelopment of Lister Road and it's uh, on the bottom of page 11 and continues uh, through on to page 12. And it's just really just um, for you to share some thinking around the project. Um, Obviously, there's obviously been a, a, a cost escalation already, and I can see from the from the report that the project has been uh, paused at phase two, at completion of drainage works, and the project team are reevaluating the suitability of the existing proposals in light of the new ways of working post COVID. Uh, and so, as I said, really, it's just whether you could um, let us into your thinking around and i've got a series of questions here um what new ways of working are you looking at and how might they impact on the existing project design what might be dropped from the existing proposals what might be added in in terms of you know the new ways of working or dropped will this produce a project cost saving or will it add additional costs when will the pause on the project uh, be lifted and when will it be recommenced? And finally, do we have uh, dates, uh, well, a delivery date for completion of, of the project? Do we have a new you know, time scale within which we're working or is it a temporary pause or is it more of a permanent pause? Thanks, Leader. OK, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, if I ask Matt to deal with specifically the Lister Road and then I think with Kevin to deal with the wider aspect of working practices, office accommodation, etc. And where we go post-Covid. Thank you, Leader. Um, 
If I'm just coming first of all, uh, then yeah, we yeah, unfortunately we've, we've we have encountered difficulties on both the first and second phase of the uh, works, mainly down to ground contamination and, and in particular to uh, two yeah. very bad uh, mine shafts that were, uh, were on no survey data and uh, as a consequence uh, we uh, we couldn't allow for them. So um, the uh, phase one, the car park and, and phase two, which is a, a, a general um, redesign of, uh, of the, um, the general layout at Lister Road, uh, they, are, uh, they are in place uh, and that is work in progress. Um, the main focus, which is main uh, phase three is the uh, office accommodation. And uh, that's where you know the uh, the consequences of uh, of, uh, of COVID and and the brave new world really uh, really need to be taken into account. So uh, we believe that um, going forward we can uh, reduce the size of the building. Um, we can increase agile working, uh, and that's on the basis that over the last uh, three months um, we had uh, 300 uh, staff in the council working in a, on an agile basis and now we have 2,300 staff working on an agile basis and I know that's not perfect um, but the council's still up and running and the council's still working and we're hoping to uh, extend that extend that philosophy to Lister Road. It is slightly different because there's a, a frontline interface but uh, we're working on a redesign where we can stay within the budget envelope and if possible uh, even uh, identify a slight saving so uh, that's uh, that's in train at the moment that's what we're doing at the minute we haven't uh, we haven't got a completion date yet but um, we should have in the next uh, few weeks or so once the uh, once the design work has been completed and uh, I'm quite happy to share that with members once we have that uh, we have that knowledge uh, thank you leader okay thank you Matt uh, Kevin, if you want to come in on the wider issue of where we go from here once we've dealt with the pandemic. Yes, uh, yes, thank you, Leader. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yep. That's great. Um, so, in, 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 I suppose in, in several respects, um, the, the emphasis in the first few months of the, uh, of the COVID um, uh, outbreak was very much on dealing with that crisis. Um, but if my uh, if my diary is a barometer um, of the way in which things have been moving, there are now very um, few COVID specific meetings in there. Uh, it's very much more around uh, a reset and recovery, and uh, that reset and recovery is uh, not just within the uh, within the council. Uh, it's something which is being uh, dealt with um, through our uh, our involvement with the combined authority. So in terms of um, what we are doing within uh, within Dudley. Um, the chief execs meet um, certainly every day uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the crisis. We're down to uh, one or two meetings a week now. Um, so there's there's a sharing of best practice across the piece. Um, so in terms of um, the way in which we will be um, reintroducing our staff, um, Matt Matt Williams is uh, is chairing um, a, a task and finish group around that. And we're also um, doing a significant piece of work with our BAME uh, staff, our um, uh, Black, Asian and Minority Ethics staff, um, the report which will be received by SEB in order to address the concerns they have. But certainly from our perspective, uh, Leader, um, the, the way in which uh, office is now addressing this, very much in the reset and recovery, very much about putting our staff first and ensuring that best practice is shared, not just uh, nationally, but right across the, the, the West Midlands. Okay, thanks. So, 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 thank you. Um, uh, I think Sean, I need to come back in quickly. We've done over an hour. Could I just come back in on the on uh, that uh, on that question, uh, leader? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. I got too much detail <laughs> detail in that response from uh, from Matt. Um, so because uh, it sounds like um, what we're saying is because we 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 know that some. A large number of staff can um, work from home or work without being in an office, agile uh, style. Um, but we don't need to accommodate them in an office block. Um, this new office block that we we're in the process of building uh, at Lister Road. So, I mean, does that mean we've got an office block without an office block, uh, and we pay? We're being told we're going to pay more or less. You know, on cost for something that doesn't 
contain the thing that it was supposed to contain, the reason for the redevelopment in the first place. So if we're not even having an office block or as many offices in an office block, what are we having there? Is it just going to be um, car parking or um, other facilities for staff? But I think it would be useful to know, you know, and it's good to hear that we're going to try and bring this in um, to the projected costs, but, you know, we do need a bit more detail. And if it is paused, um, when is the pause going to be lifted? And do we have a completion date in mind now, or is this because we do need to 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 avoid the, the the impression that this is drifting and it has is becoming open ended and rather vague. Okay, Matt. Okay, well, uh, yeah, again through you, leader. There is no office block there at all at the moment, so um, uh, we're focusing on a. Could we remove a whole floor? Uh, reduce the capacity by approximately a third, which uh, which again I think is very achievable. Or could we move the footprint of the office block completely and reposition it somewhere else, a smaller office block on the depot, which may be more convenient, and it may also um, it may also um, work well with the re residents uh, in Lister Road, uh, given that we did have some objections to an office block in the first place. So we're looking on those two strands um, and it, there will be some development work and slight uh, modifications and redesign work around that. Um, but once we've got that and we've got a timeline which won't take too long, then uh, we'll let you know and uh, we'll share that with, uh, with members. So we're just in the process at the moment of determining the new uh, um, timeline. The works are on hold until we get to that point, but it shouldn't take us too long. OK, thank you for that, Matt. Uh, Shokia, do you want to come in quickly? Yeah, thank you, Leader. Just very quickly, picking up uh, on the pertinent points Councillor John Martin has raised and in uh, uh, the response uh, from uh, Matt Williams, I think from a ward perspective, from ward councillors, I mean, what I'm picking up is there seems to be significant change in the proposed plans. And obviously, we haven't been told about it. Uh, we haven't been consulted about it. And importantly, as Matt has said, uh, residents, we need to inform residents in terms of what's going on. So I think uh, my ask, my plea is that uh, we, you know, we are provided a, a, an urgent briefing on where things are and some of the things that have been mentioned in terms of working remotely and so all of these things we mentioned right at the outset at the early stages of when these designs were first being proposed and none of those were taken on board at that stage and now we're back to square one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we'll wrap that up there. What I would say is this is a very quickly changing position that we find ourselves in now we, we, after dealing with COVID. So yes, we found out that suddenly we can have a lot more of our workforce working from home or other places rather than being locked up in office accommodation. So, and that's the most recent thing like in the last three months. So I think any, any, any criticism, uh, I, I don't think it's merited when you've got such a fast changing agenda like we have now. And all local authorities will find themselves in the same position. Uh, so as reference being uh, consulted as a ward member, obviously as and when, as Matt Williams has quite rightly pointed out, as and when we know exactly what we do need and where we go ahead with this project, then obviously you, you can be consulted. I think we've done this uh, agenda right to death now. Uh, we've done over an hour on it. The recommendations there are there on page one. You cabinet colleagues agree? Aye. <laughs> Just nod your heads for the record. OK, thank you. OK, moving on, agenda item six is the revenue outturn 1920 and the midterm financial strategy. On pages 20 to 31, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, this report sets out the financial results for the year ended 31st of March 2020, subject to audit. Uh, the general fund outturn was half a million pounds better than the forecast in February, but reserves have still fallen by 6.9 million during the year. They are at a low level when compared with most other councils. 
now we face the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as being a terrible human tragedy, this is a major financial challenge to the council. We still don't know what path the virus will take, what health measures will be needed, or what the economic impacts will be. So the forecast in this report are highly uncertain. At the time of writing the report, we had received £19.1 million of COVID-19 grant from the government, and our assessment of the financial impact exceeded this by more than £8 million. Since then, the government has announced further support. A further £500 million of unring-fenced unring grant at national level, which will relate to round about three, three million pounds to us in Dudley. Additional compensation for lost income from fees and charges, such as our uh, car park charges, our town hall hire, and money from the swimming baths, etc. Permission has also been given by government to spread the council tax and business rates losses over three years, and it possibly could be even longer. Further consideration of council tax and business rates losses uh, in the spending review will be done in the autumn. We're awaiting more details on Dudley's allocation of the money and the precise details of how the additional support will work. Uh, we will report to Cabinet again in September and October and sooner if that need be. I move the report's recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank, 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 thanks, Steve. I've got Pete. At the moment, I've only got Pete. OK, off you go. Off you go, mate. And then Councillor. Chief Scott. Leader. Chief Leader, can everybody hear me OK? I can only see Hi. more people on the screen, but uh, I'm taking from the thumbs up from Steve and Patrick uh, that you can... Uh, I, I just want to make really a couple of observations and a couple of points. Firstly, on Steve's point with regard to the ever-changing uh, position, I absolutely... Uh, take on board. And I recognise, as you outline in paragraph four, uh, that there may be changes to this report in October and indeed there will be uh, in all likelihood significant uh, changes to that. I want to pick up one of the points, uh, Leader, that you made in a response to one of the questions in the previous item, because I think it's pertinent uh, to this report. And that was a comment that, uh, uh, that uh, CADA raised with regard to capital schemes, and the response was that none of the capital schemes are at risk. And the question is really, is either, from my assumption, you even know something that we don't know, or that is the worst negotiating position in history, because either a discussion has already been had and an agreement for political reasons will then be announced in due time down in Westminster, in which case, please put us out of our misery, or the alternative isn't the worst negotiating position in history in the fact that you've made a commitment now that if the government don't give us the money, that you're going to give uh, your finance lead an extra burden of uh, £13 million uh, borrowing. So uh, an initial response to that would be, uh, would be useful about which one it is. Uh, I, I suspect I know, but uh, I would like confirmation uh, on that. I'd then like to turn to page 24 and paragraph 16 to 18. And really, Steve, what, what I'm doing here is theming it more around preparedness rather than devil in the detail, because I note fully with regard to the ever-changing scenario of COVID and, and we are changing week by week and certainly uh, month by month. So I'm certainly not holding you to account for the figures. What I'm very interested in doing is having a look at uh, our preparedness uh, for the future channel uh, challenges. Now, paragraph 19 
for example, talks about the unprecedented degree of uncertainty surrounding the forecasts and we're not amending the budget at this time. Yet within the hour and a half we've had so far in the Cabinet meeting and with the uh, environmental motion, uh, the paper coming later on, it's very clear that the culture within the Council has already changed from March uh, to uh, this day. We've discussed uh, home working, we've discussed reduced revenue. So what estimation have we got in place in order to be able to address that? Leading, you'll be aware that we, we passed the uh, Fair Deal for Dudley uh, motion back in 2018. The previous leader, CADA, uh, jointly wrote with Steve and myself and yourself. One of the questions I would like, and, and I, I recognise uh, you won't be able to uh, uh, give it today, but uh, I would be really interested, Steve, in the communications that you have had both pre-COVID uh, and post-COVID with regard to the fair deal for Dudley. And the reason I raise that is because Steve will know better than, than, than many the, the challenge I gave three years ago when the Conservative opposition turned down the opportunity to increase the council tax base by what would have been £1 million per year would have now been uh, uh, £3 million better off as a result of that. So what have we done with your, what letters have you written, whether that be to Robert Jenrick or his predecessor, and what are the responses? Because uh, uh, I haven't had uh, any of them. The second point, and again, uh, it's linked to the previous discussion leader, it's around procurement. And whilst I recognise that the budget at this point has not been amended, it's really a question about what work has been done in light of the motions around local fair deal in order to ensure and inoculate ourselves for the post-COVID world from a uh, procurement basis. So what contracts do we currently have that have been re renewed and what is the financial impact on that? And I'll give a, a fairly clear example uh, as to the budgetary means of that. Forgive me for, for, for carrying on here, uh, Patrick, but That's one of the discussions we've been having in, a, in the, uh, the Cabinet and indeed the full Council is that the amount of capital spend in order to bring Council remote services, the Council Chamber, teams up to being able to deal with the uh, with the future. Now, of course, we were having that discussion in a pre-COVID world where the issue of investment would have been a different discussion point than we would be having now. What work has been done in order to ensure that that is then built into a uh, future budget? Paragraph 16 uh, talks about the pay award, which is already at 2.75% uh, per when we budgeted for uh, a two percent so already there's a strain in the revenue of that but of course an element of that could be clawed back potentially with the savings on either expenses or car parking uh, the, the stuff then so what work has been done and what is the estimate and on that point it'd be interesting to see whether as an administration we support uh, our local uh, council employees in an above uh, two percent uh, pay increase because again it would be prudent for budgetary purposes if we're working from the same estimate. I note within the report he's working on a 3%. Steve, do you support a 3% uh, pay increase uh, uh, for uh, public sector workers or not? And uh, the, the rationale with that. So just to bring those into uh, clear, because I, I recognise you've got a thankless task leader in both chairing this meeting, taking notes, uh, and, and I look forward to uh, uh, Dudley's first citizen being able to, to to do that. And an interesting point on that, certainly within, the, your own. certainly within the health service, these meetings have been run very, very differently, and uh, uh, Patrick would have support in being able to manage this process rather than having to do uh, all of what you're, you're doing up there, and I certainly don't envy you. So, in a nutshell, what correspondence has been entered into with regard to the fair deal for Dudley? What do you know, Patrick? Is it the best negotiating position in the world or the worst negotiating position? What do you know that we do not, uh, in which case, or the alternative, heaven help us? 
and the situation uh, with regard to making sure that we are uh, in a position for the post-COVID world and our budget is aligned to that. And that's to ensure that the environment uh, issue that we come on to later isn't just an issue of words rather than action. Yes. Thank you very much, Leader, and uh, apologies okay. for getting on. No, thanks, Pete. Uh, just to answer you directly, um, I'll let Steve come in on the on, on, on the fair deal correspondence there. Uh, Simon may want to come in on any issues around procurement and Steve or Ian may want to come in on the general points around the budget that you raised. But on what we're talking to ministers about, I've personally written to several ministers. One is to try and keep hold of any business rates from the from business grants that we've been given so that we can retain that. Uh, they were very generous, so generous that they gave us more money than we could ever hope to give away to, 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 to local businesses. Even though we've we've got rid of the, the vast majority of what we feel we can, we're now into, I think, the end of the first or start of the second round of uh, the discretionary grants to business. So we would ask that we can retain the majority of that. Far easier for government to, to, to let us retain possibly £10 million than it is then to write a cheque a little while later in August, September for say 15 million pounds. So a lot easier to give us the smaller amount later on. Let us keep what we've got now. Obviously we wrote to them about uh, VLR funding. Uh, we've also had a key role to play in preparing the 3.2 billion pounds uh, shopping list from the LEP and, and, and the combined authority and that has been done jointly. And you know VLR is it is the possibly the number one project for the West Midlands. You know, for too long, funding has gone to places like Birmingham, Coventry, but it's the black country's turn now. And as we look at more DVAL deals and we look at more funding uh, released from central government, I think all four black country leaders are united in saying it's our time now. You know, your Birmingham's and your Coventry's have had their fair share in the first couple of years of this devolved government. Uh, it's, it's our time now. And I think you'll find that, the, you know, the four leaders are very much united in, in going on that stance. As to whether it's the best uh, negotiating tactic of all time, you'll have to wait and see. I don't have any clear steer from central government as of yet. It is still very early days. But we've put our marker down. If they want to support infrastructure projects, then the ones that we have mentioned, such as VLR, Institute of Technology, these are the projects that need to be supported. They are new, they create high quality jobs, and they put Dudley and the wider black country, they really put us on that map. So if, if, if you wanna build, 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 to coin a phrase from last week, then back Dudley. Uh, Steve, do you wanna yep. come in on the general budget points? Yeah. And if Simon wanted to come on the procurement issues that Pete raised. If I could just go to some of Pete's points. Um, the first one is about the um, employer offer that uh, initially 2.75 has been rejected um, as a pay award. And so what we have done is we have put um, 1.3 million in the current year, which is based on the 3% that um, will be offered. And yes, Pete, I would support that, which is the first question that you, or sorry, the last question that you asked. Um, one thing I also would like to say about the leader just talking about the extra money that was given to us. We were actually given 66 million by the government uh, to, to deal with the business grants. Um, we have spent 55 million. And so what has happened is that Pat has uh, written to the government to say, can we hang on to that extra money and use that within our general fund, um, of which is necessary. The um, spending, as I said earlier, we've, we've gone 8 million pounds over what we need to spend on COVID, but to put that in perspective, 
Birmingham have gone over by 100, sorry, 212 million. So we've gone over 8 million. Birmingham have gone over 212 million. There's certain things that we haven't put in there, um, such as the zoo, for example. So the zoo needed a loan um, to help them, which we've given them of uh, half a million pounds. That money has not gone into the budget because at this point we haven't laid that out. It says a loan. So we actually haven't put it in as a final amount. Uh, we've also got the Black Country Living Museum that has asked us for a million pound loan. Also, that hasn't been given them to them yet, which we are considering it. Uh, but those kind of things have not been put into this budget either. And one thing you've also got to remember is that this budget is up to the end of March. And whilst we had some funding in, uh, initially, this budget just takes it, I think it's about £8.5 million over. So it actually, the balance sheet looks quite good on, um, on this report, but it, it, it then moves into the following year. Um, as far as the fair deal, the fairer funding deal is concerned, um, to be honest, Pete, it seems as though it's being kicked down the road. Um, it's not something that I like because I do feel as though Dudley would get a better deal by actually having this fairer funding um, done by the government. Their, their priorities aren't with doing a fairer funding policy for Dudley at this point. Um, they've obviously got COVID and, uh, and um, various other bits and pieces on their agenda at the moment. But I, I, I do agree with you, Pete. We, we do need to actually pull that forward. So I think um, an, another letter from us to actually try and bring it back to the forefront would be the right thing to do and do it as a joint one again, you know, from yourselves and ourselves. Um, with reference to the capital budgets, we, we're just trying to build in there a little bit of tolerance for us. Um, none of those things should uh, be cancelled at all. But the tolerance is there so that if um, we don't get any help, so for example, that eight million pounds, if we don't get that up, we've got to make that up from somewhere. I can't see it being taken out of the capital um, uh, budget at all. It may be that we have to borrow that eight million. I don't know. It's, it's this stuff for um, looking at, at well, we just got to look at that. I don't know whether, Ian, is there anything else that you want to put into there that's a bit more technical? Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, I think our next steps uh, in terms of the budget process, um, Steve mentioned in his introduction uh, the latest government uh, announcement last week. Um, yeah, we know there's 500 million nationally, but we need to determine exactly how much uh, comes to Dudley. Steve's given indication it might be 3 million. I think that's that's probably quite probable. There's a lot of devil in the detail of uh, the additional support to fees and charges. We need to see the detail of how that's actually going to work and calculate what that is going to be. Uh, worth to us. Um, they, at the moment, uh, our forecasts include a shortfall of around uh, approaching eight and a half billion business rights and council tax collection in the current year. Under rules as they stood before, we would have had to have taken that as a hit next year, which would have been extremely challenging. They've now said uh, we can spread that over three years. Um, and the government's also indicated they'll take account of future year effects in the in the spending uh, review. So what we need to do now is work out how much difference all of that actually makes to the position. Um, and then we need to come back and assess what the gap is, if there is still a gap and what we need to do with it, which is why um, the proposal is to come sooner than we ordinarily would with a finance report in September. Um, normally, we would wait till October. We haven't got that amount of time. 
Okay, I think we've got Simon wanting to come back in on the procurement. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. So um, on the procurement point, um, it was decided back in February, March time that all standard procurement activity would shift towards procuring um, personal protective equipment and cleaning equipment that we needed um, for uh, uh, social care services and by extension partners out there in the in the private and the education sector as well. So um, since then, we have been mainly concentrating on, on purchasing PPE. Um, as we are now returning to some kind of business as usual, we do need to review all of the contracts that are going to expire. Um, that is as a result of us making sure that we've got the equipment that we need. Um, so we're doing that at the moment. That work is underway. Some contracts might indeed need uh, extending, but the normal procurement policies will apply in my mind. Um, we should be looking for uh, savings if possible or eliminating uh, or limiting any cost increases on any extensions um, and I would expect the procurement team to be working on that as it would be any other time to make sure that we've got the uh, value for money that we need from the contracts um, and also as well uh, I've had one note to say that we have actually had now um, an updated government procurement notice which allows us to vary and amend contracts um, that have been uh, disrupted due to, to COVID, the, the retender in the contracts there. So I think that will go into the system and we'll have to um, factor that in with our future work on making sure that the contracts we do extend are working for us and then get back to a position where we can be a lot more proactive in working up to the point where the contracts extend to retender rather than having to um, having to extend them. I don't think that anybody wants to extend the contracts, but I think we made the right decision in concentrating on getting the PPE in and taking the hit with extending some contracts in the short term whilst we actually get used to the new normal. So that, that's it from procurement. OK, thank you, Simon. OK, next on the list is Kada. Can you hear me? Hopefully, we can. Yeah. We can. Yeah. Um, just a couple of comments on this, and it's following on from uh, what Councillor Lowe said. Um, very worrying report, actually. Um, and I'm surprised at the leisurely manner in which it was presented. Um, we have a potential problem of um, a million pound a month, uh, which is costs that we know of yet. Obviously, those costs are likely to escalate as the amount of support starts to reduce post-COVID and we don't know what the state of our local economy is. And also, of course, that, um, that there are some risks in here that we're not yet able to quantify. Now, I accept fully at this stage that it's a work in, uh, you know, work in motion, really. But we have a Tory council, a Tory government, a Tory mayor. We always feel blessed, don't we, on this occasion? Um, we we need to make sure that um, we're not let down by this government. And if the people of Dudley end up paying for COVID, uh, when we were told that uh, we've managed it well, according to what uh, Councillor Clark said, in comparison to how Birmingham have have coped then I think it's important that everyone, and on this side, we, we happily will do whatever it takes to flag this up early, because um, the worst thing that can happen is we end up push, putting this burden on local. Councillor Harley, you've frozen. Is that um, intentional because of the alarm, or is it the uh, technology? No, I'm just listening to your laid-back tones. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's just the technology then. So what I was what I was saying was that we on this side are happy to support in any cross party right letter writing, lobbying, whatever it takes. But the people of Dudley cannot be expected at a time of of such difficulty and burden that they've got and people worrying about their jobs to have to find out that they they'll get further reduction in services. Uh, as a direct result of having to pick up the pieces of of COVID. So I think um, we're ready to do whatever it takes and quickly um, because we can't accept that we are in a position today 
that if we accept the 8 million, and I, I think from my GCSE maths, it got down to 5 million, um, that we still have a, a problem uh, of significant uh, gratitude that we, we don't know what the answer to it is. Okay, thank you for your comments. What I would say is that, yes, on this side, we will be working tirelessly to make sure that we get the best possible deal coming out of this pandemic that we, we can. And that means working with fellow uh, black country authorities and indeed the other authorities across the whole of the West Midlands with the CA. And I'm confident that, you know, Dudley, uh, w this burden will not be put on the residents of Dudley. Uh, I believe that this cabinet and the officer team and our staff throughout probably every directorate have worked their socks off to try and maintain service, you know, normal service. Uh, as well as dealing with, you know, what could, well, you know from your own day-to-day uh, -day experience, it, 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 it's been a nightmare. But it's been a nightmare that I think that the the team, when I say the team, I mean everyone concerned, uh, uh, has handled absolutely brilliantly. And at the right time, we'll, we'll have to thank this team because they have been utterly, utterly brilliant. Um, the, the next one was... I've got Councillor Ridney, Shokat, Judy, and then John. So, Sue, off you go. Thank you, Leader. Um, I, I just want to, uh, paragraph 17 on page 24, uh, the challenges for children's services. Uh, we have always tried to uh, reduce the um, placement outside of borough. That's been something that we have always um, maintained that we wanted to do. Um, and also homeschool transport. I'm a little perplexed in the fact that we that the new contracts came into effect in September. So it's saying that we are still under considerable pressure. I thought the whole idea of that was to reduce um, our costs. So I very much appreciate a briefing on these particular aspects, please. Okay, thank you, Sue. If if, if uh, Kath and Ruth can arrange that briefing for Sue, that would be appreciated. Thank, Thank you, Leda. No problem at all. Moving on to Shokat. Yeah, uh, thank you, Leda. Um, we yeah, we all know that uh, the last three months plus have been quite challenging uh, for everyone and unprecedented times. Um, and it's absolutely vital that we do get a fair deal for Dudley, as has been said. And uh, you know, there was mention of the spending review that some of these things will be taken account into that. And we do know that sometimes these spending reviews, they don't come favorable in terms of Dudley's uh, support. So, you know, that lobbying, that campaigning to the government, it, it, it's vital. Uh, also, uh, importantly, obviously, we, we're coming uh, out of lockdown and things are being eased and we are preparing uh, for the second wave or anticipated second wave. And as we come out of this first phase, there will be heavier reliance on some services like social care, like mental health, uh, obviously schools, public health and all of those. But so my question is, have we identified uh, all the risks and have they been incorporated into this medium term financial strategy? I'll let, I'll let Steve come in, but what I would say, and I've already alluded to this point, this is a fast-changing scenario. So a lot of this we, 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 we are dealing with on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, so you know, I think your criticism is, is uh, unfair, to, and that's putting it mildly. Steve, did you want to come back in? Steve? Are you there? Yeah, I, I, there's nothing I really need to say to that. Um, you know, in terms of the risks, we, we, we've um, allocated all the funds to the um, businesses in terms of the discretionary grant. We've still got one million pounds left of that discretionary grant to allocate. Uh, we've kept that um, uh, so that we can make sure that we can give it to as many people as possible. So we've we've geared that at your market traders and um, other sectors. So uh, that that will be going out within the next month. But as far as 
Um, the risks, the PPE, um, and I think Simon Wall has just said that we have got enough PPE at the moment. It's been a very challenging time. We don't, um, I, you know, we, we've got everything pretty well. Uh, well, no, we, we haven't funded it well enough, but uh, sorry, let me say that again. Within the funding, the 11 million that we've still got in the bank, we have asked the government if we can keep that. We have spent 8 million more than we should have done, and we should be getting a further 3 million from this 500 um, million that's been allocated. So if that is the case, we, we that should um, help our budget. OK, um, going on, I think we've got Judy and then John. Kershid as well, please. I can't see your hand, Kersh, where are you? <laughs> I'll add you to the list. Thank you, okay, Judy. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, I, I'm quite surprised that um, a, a gathering of these, of us as you know, senior leaders on the council, and this report, um, we haven't had any mention at all of into. Um, I know that the cabinet member for finance has expressed through the press his concerns about the the, the risk around into. I also know that INTO is a very complex organisation with complex financial arrangements. But what I don't want to do as a local ward councillor representing many people who have a relationship with the centre, whether that's employment or otherwise, I don't want to just rely on the press to get the facts and understand what the risks are. And I'm quite surprised there's no reference to this in the report, given the risk to a reduction of business rates. Um, so I'm really looking to a response, please. What, where, where do we stand with Into at the moment? What is the council's interest? Uh, what can it do in terms of providing any support uh, in relation to the risks uh, that might in fact be manifested through job losses, whatever? And what information, what quantity information can councillors have about what is a, you know, a, is a really important uh, a really important employer um, and a really important asset in the borough, uh, which you know, which a lot of other organisations and businesses um, may be making uh, decisions about because of it being part of the overall offer at the waterfront and the, in the Bridley Hill town itself. Okay, I'll let Steve Clark come in because I know that Steve's actually met virtually with the uh, representatives representatives of into and or the administrators but what i would say i think i think you, the, the point you've made is it, it, a poor one this report was presented well before into announced that they were going into administration so your point is it, it's a poor one judy and i expect better of you than that into is a very important player in in in, in the dudley environment we receive, Steve will correct me, £20 million in business rates. So, of course, they're important, but the shops will not close. They will still continue to operate. And although Into, as a group, is in trouble, the centre is extremely profitable. And I'm, I'm certainly confident that uh, someone will pick it up. Steve, do you want to come back in? Well, yes, I, thank I you. No, no, unless, you, unless you want reports written... 24 hours ago, Judy, <laughs> your point is, <laughs> Steve, do you want to come in? That's, that's not what, like, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, let, let, let me just respond and I'll come back. I'm, I'm moving on, Steve. All right, um, let me just tell you a little bit more about Into. I have uh, spoken with uh, KPMG about Into and what was happening about it. Um, and there is a uh, transitional service agreement arranged with uh, Into and KPMG which will last over the next three months, which is funded by um, the administrators so that people will be able to manage um, getting into and uh, maintaining all the shop areas within into. So that will continue to be exactly the same. The only one issue that they did have was that the uh, gift cards, uh, there was various issues with into gift cards being used within the centre and it turns out that the gift cards will be able to be used. The further 
um, the, the, the transitional service agreement actually lasts uh, six months, but the, the funding is only there for the first three. So um, INTO and KPMG are looking to find that funding for the uh, remaining six months. They are looking at a number of different operators. I mean, hopefully they're not going down the sort of Philip Green route because that's not where we want to be with this one. Um, and they are keeping me in touch with uh, everything that is going on within the administration of INTO. Um, and, and that's as far as I can tell you at the moment. I mean, in terms of the whole revenue for Merry Hill, that is actually worth 20 million to us in terms of business rates. It was never going to be in this report because that report finishes at the end of March. So we were at this point when we were preparing this report into hadn't gone into administration. But I take on board what you are saying. It is a very valuable employer. However, as long as it stays open, and all the shops stay in business there, the revenue still will come in to us in terms of the business rates. A small part of it, which is represents into, obviously will be missing, but I think they will find a new buyer for that. Okay, thank you, Steve. Okay. Um, I may come back on that, Lee. Yeah. I don't know why, Lee, you thought that was a poor question. The fact is, the Cabinet Member for Finance himself was recently uh, recently addressed the press expressing what his concerns were. That has been picked up by a number of constituents. They have approached me for a number of facts, which the cabinet member has just provided me with. But to, yeah, and I, and I take that point, and it's an important issue, but it, it is not relevant for this report. As Steve said, it, it goes to the end of March. I understand and, that. And, and to try and link it in as, and to offer some criticism, though you didn't mention into in this report, I think it's a pretty cheap shot, well, a cheap no, military I shot. Say, I didn't say he didn't mention it. What I'm saying is he didn't mention it his, in his, his report. When he was speaking to this report, he could have raised the issue of into. There have been a number of issues outside of the period uh, under question that have been raised, including looking at some horizon scanning and the risks going forward. It was a perfectly reasonable question. I disagree. Well, a reasonable question, but the way it was put, I thought it was poor, but that's my opinion. OK, we move on. Uh, Councillor Martin. Hello, uh, uh, Leader. Thank you for that. That's um, just, uh, just a couple of uh, questions and uh, so, uh, in terms of um, business rates, um, just a quick question, maybe uh, Ian Newman, if he's still on, on the line. Um, how much does the uh, council receive in business rates? That would be my first question. I've got a couple of other follow-up ones. I, 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 sorry, I was trying to keep an eye who's business rates from where? In general? Um, just in, how, much, how much does Dudley Council receive uh, in business rates? Right, Steve. Is that you just mean from Merry Hill or are you mean in, in total? total in total. In it's total, about 100 yeah. million, just over 100 million, I believe. If Ian could correct me on that. Uh, it's net, it's around 80 million. Okay. Either. So, um, would you then um, support the comments of. Um, a senior member of the uh, administration um, this week when they called publicly for all business rates to be cancelled because I would imagine losing £80 million net would have a, a huge effect on the council's ability to operate. Um, we're obviously talking about an overspend at the moment of just over £8, 8 million in terms of the COVID impact, but losing £80 million would have a catastrophic effect. So I suppose the question would be, do you support the cause of the chief, Conservative Chief Whip to, uh, that all business rates should be cancelled? That would be my first Ian, question. do you want to come into that one about the, the way the business rates are going to be working? Yeah, in... Uh, in the current year, um, it is already the case that retail, um, hospitality and leisure and nursery uh, business rates have already been cancelled for the current year. They have been replaced by government section 31 grant. 
So um, as like as long as the cancellation, as as long as the cancellation of business rates is covered by a government grant, that doesn't worsen our financial position. Clearly, if that support went uh, wider, it would be support to local businesses uh, and it wouldn't hit our pocket as long as the same Section 31 grant applied. So basically, as long as the government funded business rates... In some other way, John, yes, we'll be fine. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And so the other, the other question is, um, in, in terms of the uh, £8 million projected um, overspend, on um, the impact of COVID. Um, I can see, a, a, you know, Appendix C of the report give us a, gives us a good breakdown of uh, the areas where that, that's occurred. Um, what, what sort of measures, because I mean, obviously this is unprecedented, what sort of control measures are in place before the authority allows itself to get into a position of having an eight million pound overspend is that something that is just left to the uh, directors uh, with their cabinet members or you know is the finance cabinet member in overall charge of that or does, does it also require input from the leader of the council to, to sign off well it it means the input and involvement of the entire team be that officer and senior elected members of course, senior elected members have a part to play in that. So, so the £6 million overspend on adults, for instance, uh, how were you involved in, 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 in authorising that spend, additional spend? John, we will do, well, we have done, as we're now coming out of this, so there isn't so much pressure, but in the very heady days of this, in late March and in early April, we have done whatever we have had to do to protect the public from this pandemic. And okay. I think looking at our performance, uh, that, that, that work and that spending has been fully justified. Okay, my last question and, is... And I just, um, just, just finish that point. Uh, yeah, and the government have made a commitment that we will tot up all our, if you want to, if you want to use a COVID uh, debt, but you put what you've spent in that COVID debt and hopefully at the end of the day, the government will, 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 will compensate us for it. You, authorities, local authorities, really don't have a choice. You know, we've had to spend that money. And the big spending briefs, like children's, like adults, they will take the lion's share of that. And it's, it's, it's not a choice that we've got. We've got to do it. It's the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, and the report uh, at Appendix C, you know, lays that out for us all to see. I was just, I was just uh, curious as to how, because obviously, yeah, you know, the, elected, me, elected members me, haven't... Me, have, have, John, probably more meetings we could... Yeah, haven't been, haven't been in, done like. You know, I was just curious because it's, it's obviously a unique situation, isn't it? And it's just interesting it, to, know, to, to know how the council. We've never had to how face the council before. works. Yeah. And, and, so my, and my last question. We we'll have to face it again. My last question, leader, is um, if, as you say, you know, when we put all our COVID spending into one pot, and you know, hopefully the government, you said. Hopefully, the government will, will 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 step in and give us the the extra eight 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 point four million pounds back. If they don't, um, it means we may need to identify additional savings from next year. So, are we broadly saying that the figures as as laid out in Appendix C, we will be looking to the same areas to recover? those same amounts in savings from next year. I've got Matt Boucher wanting to speak. I'll let him come in first and then we'll answer that. Matt? Thank you, Leader. Can everybody pick up my audio OK? Yep. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to clarify the point about six million overspend. The six million invested was two ring fence sums passed down by government. Uh, firstly, in relation to infection control, we put 2.9 million into residential and nursing care homes in the borough and a further 2.5 million has been invested uh, in terms of viability to support those care providers who are struggling due to a loss of income during the COVID period. Um, both those sums of money have got very specific grant conditions attached and have been invested appropriately. So it's not an overspend against the general fund as such. Okay. Thanks for that. So, 
so in terms of when the cabinet member for finance um, says in public and is quoted in the Express and Star as saying it means we may need to identify additional savings from next year. Which which budgets are we talking about? Steve? Because he, he, he must have had something in mind when he said that. Well, it, no, no, no. What, what I'm saying is that if, if if the government don't give it to us, we've got to find it from somewhere because we've spent and, what we needed to spend it on. Yeah, but you're right. So you've said it means we may need to identify additional savings from next year. You must have some thoughts already about where those savings will be achieved if the government don't don't. Uh, no, come, come no. we're pursuing the government at the moment to make sure that they 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 give us that money. But it, but if they don't, we've got to find the money from somewhere because we've spent it. Okay, and there, and do you have you, you've done no work about where that money will come from if they don't. No, because what we're doing is making sure that the people of Dudley are as safe as possible. And we had to spend what we had to spend on this, this unfortunately, on this 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 pandemic that's, that's happened. And so, um, you know, they've done very well to just keep it at eight million. And so when uh, we'll be asking the government to help with that eight million. But if they don't, then we need to find it from somewhere. Okay, I think that's. I think. I, I'm sorry, I've got Kershid as well. Kershid, where are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Thank you, leader. Um, my maths isn't very good. It's just, just a clarification that I need from Councillor Clark. He, he sort of mentioned about considering a grant loan to uh, the Zoo and Black Country Museum. Um, I'm just so surprised to hear that actually, particularly as a we're borrowing money from left, right, and centre to make sure that some of our projects that, we, that are being overspent. Uh, uh then funded so where's that coming from we i mean how much consideration will be will we be giving to that because in particular i mean you got you and black country museum have been very successful thankfully uh trying to get some of their own funding from the leps and all the combined authorities i'm just confused about that please if you can be clarified i'll be grateful yeah in terms of the zoo um the they they needed the money they they were struggling so we we were duty bound to actually help them in terms of a loan it's not a grant at all it's a loan and with the um black country living museum they have asked us for a million pound loan uh, we haven't given that to them at this point but we are considering it no sorry mike sorry through leader apologies for coming back to this uh, the council's in a similar position we just talked about an overspend of eight million uh, eight million pounds uh, there is going to be an impact on various you know, uh, departments and sections throughout the council. But, you know, yes, I accept the duty, but surely they can go out and borrow their own money, can't they? Or does it? Do we need to give money? I think the, the point, Kirshen, is that we can borrow the money far more cheaply than what they can, and it's a loan. We're not giving it them; they do have to repay that that loan at some point. Together with the interest that we would have had to pay, is that right? Of course, because we're going to do it at a loss, are we? And you know, no, 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 no council leader, be it myself or or, Kada or, or or Pete, would would we, we can't allow institutions like the Black Country Living Museum or indeed the zoo to 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 to, uh, to go through the mill. We really can't. So if we can support them, we will. But it's a loan; it'll get repaid back. Thanks for the I only wish, only wish I could borrow money at the same rate as the council. It'd be great. I think. I think that is it, folks, on, on that. Thank you for your contributions. I've got one one hand up. Who is it? Because it's not showing me. Or is that someone who's already spoken? Ian Newman. I Ian Newman, OK. Ian, yeah. off you go. Have the last word. Sorry, it's me. Just for a clarification on that last point, uh, the uh, debt from the zoo um, is a number of separate items um, that actually pre-existed the COVID situation. I can give you a written reply on the detail of that. So we have not at this point uh, made any loan to the zoo as a direct result of the COVID situation. It's pre-existing debt, so I'll, I'll give you that. The BCLM, uh, as has been said, is a request. It's not a request we've acted on at this stage and that's why it's not included in the numbers thank you Ian. okay then folks the recommendations on page 20 are as laid out is that all agreed my colleagues aye 
Moving on then to agenda item seven, annual review of equality 2019, pages 30 to 34. Call on Councillor Nick Barlow. Are you there? Nick? Okay, then I'll move it. Okay, if Nick's not around. Okay, then annual review of Equality 2019. Recommendations are there on page 32. Do we have any contributions? Any questions? Leader Kershaw. Thank you, Kershaw. I can see your hand, Kershaw. Sorry. Thank you, Leader. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen many of these reviews over the years. Uh, is someone able to provide evidence-based data as to how we have, or as the case may be, not have been able to meet the duty under the Equality Act over the last 10, 10 or so years ago, as far as the employment is concerned? Um, we just want to make sure that, you know, it's not just a um, paper exercise. There, there has been some positive action taken. And uh, if it can be summarised in a small, you know, um, uh, sheet of paper, that'll be useful for all of us. And if there are failings, then we need, just need to make sure whatever those flaws are, we need to rectify as soon as possible. Thank you, Nita. Okay, thanks, Kershaw. I'm sure uh, Val, who's the author of this report, can probably get you those answers in a more, more detailed manner than what we can tonight. Any other comments or questions from colleagues? No. Oh, sorry, sorry, Showcat, sorry. Off you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, your, sir. your hand is hidden by all these things <laughs> on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, the, the first question relates to the report, uh, you know, which was attached to this report. I mean, obviously, it isn't in, in this here. Uh, uh, and it's, it refers to paragraph 33, uh, grievances and disciplinary actions. And, and I think the report says that 20% disciplinary cases uh, were in BAME employees. So I just wanted to uh, ask uh, on this uh, whether the situation has improved and why, you know, higher percentage of disciplinary against um, uh, disciplinary actions in relation to BAME. Uh, and then second, my second question is uh, in relation to seniority of staff within the, the local authority. Um, uh, what is the situation on, uh, in relation uh, to that? Okay, thanks for that, Shoka. Uh, is Nick or Bala able to answer the questions that uh, Shoka has just raised? Hi, Bal. Bal, you're on mute. Okay. Um, um, I have got Simon who's joined me on this call, so he might be able to help um, um, with, with further clarification. But we will, we, we can look at the disciplinary data. I'm not sure whether we've um, looked at it recently. Um, and also the question around the seniority of staff. If you note, um, we have... Um, we have actually commissioned an additional piece of work um, that was to look into a bit more detail um, and it was an independent review um, around the council's equality provision so um, I need to just check if that data is going to be included in that and we will be bringing that report to a future cabinet meeting um, with the recommendations in there. Okay thank you. Any other comments? Oh, uh, Councillor Zarda. Yes, sorry. Uh, just to let you know that Nick has put on the text that his IT yes. is frozen. So that's probably why you can't hear. Um, the, what I was going to say, I think it's been picked up by my colleagues, uh, but just to add to this, I think what I think we ought to move to is a position where we stop making these annual reports and uh, just to tick the box. We really need to get to a position where these are genuinely uh reports that influence change um 
I mean, you, you know, there are a couple of anomalies in there. I suspect these are issues that have been picked up in this report. I have contributed, and I know you have led to the discussions that are happening in the independent, independent review. And I know that we've had a chat uh, separately around how we need to make the council more reflective of the community that it serves. Um, and, and we do need to think about how those... Uh, those equality strands across the whole of the local authority, whether that be about ethnicity, sex, uh, or uh, sexual orientation or disabilities or whatever they are, are ab absolutely re re reflected in the workforce that we've got. Um, because actually uh, that will make the biggest change to the services that we provide. So I'm happy uh, to accept that this is the last of these reports that we bring forward that is just about a tick box exercise and i would like us to work together on what it is that's going to come to the 2021 uh 2021 um equality strategy with an action plan we do know that a number of our colleagues uh from uh, <clears throat> various different ethnic ethnicities have fell felt the bigger burden burden on COVID for whatever reasons and we need to understand what what those reasons are and how we can support them so um, my, my my plea here is that we really need to get this right and I'm not here championing one particular strain of the equality I want to I want to champion every bit of it um, you know I absolutely think we need a lot of work on this. And I, and I do think across every single administration to date, this has just been one of those things that we bring here, uh, you know, come March, April, May, June or July. And uh, we need to we need to, to, to do that. Um, I'm not asking for an argument on it. I just want us to sort this out together. I don't think you'll have an argument, Cader. I think, I think your point's been well made. Uh, it is frustrating for all of us. A lot of us have spent so many years here, and, and, and some reports are a tick box exercise. Um, you know, hoping this one isn't, but I take on board what you're saying about doing a more meaningful piece of work uh, that, that you know, shows that we, we're making a difference. We know exactly where we are on these issues. I've got, I've got um, a duty to come in, but I've also got Simon. I would imagine Simon is on one of the points picked up by colleagues so far. It was only really briefly to touch on um, uh, just a, a very uh, small response um, of some information that I know about uh, what is being done. Um, well, we are trying now to work to understand exactly what the effect is um, on our BAME um, employees with regards to COVID. So that is a piece of work that is going on in the background. Um, Councillor Zada mentioned it um, in terms of the wider impact on, on that community, on those communities. Um, I thought I'd just specifically mention that for our employees, we are looking at that from from that point of view um and it's something that I, I mentioned to the um we had a chat about with the head of hr recently so that that is something that's being done in the background and i thought it might be important just to clarify that, that is being done okay thanks simon uh judy uh my my question um is that first of all an observation with a question and then i'll ask a question directly on appendix one of the uh, the action plan um, I observed a meeting uh, of the uh, Corporate Scrutiny Committee last week where a report was received about homeworking. And I have to say, homeworking has been generally, I'm sure Matt Williams will agree with me, who chairs the steering group, that homeworking has been received quite well across the board by employees and managers. I'd be very interested to see what impact homeworking and new ways of working have had on workplace complaints within which uh, the, the strands of equality often feature, like, for example, racism, um, potentially sexual harassment, disability, and so on. I think it would be good to get a report for the future in some way to, to demonstrate what the differences are, whether there are, there are changing patterns, both in terms of employee satisfaction, but also the number of workplace complaints and types of workplace complaints that new patterns of working might deliver. The second question I want to ask is related to the Equality Strategy Action Plan. Uh, the first item, identi identify member and equality uh, officer, member and officer equality champions 
which was the piece of work to be done by uh, review in March, April 2020. Uh, who are the member champions and officer champions? I'm assuming they're not necessarily uh, members of uh, the, the lead member for public health or officers of public health. I'm assuming that they're from across the council. But who are they and what is their role? What does that role look like? Okay, thank you, Judy. Uh, Bal, do you want to come in there? Bal, you're on mute. It double mute. It double mute. Sorry. Um, yes, um, I can get that information, leader, on on the, on the role of the champions and who they are. Um, but I also had my hand raised um, just to give you a quick overview of the work that we have started around the BAME population. So there is going to be a subgroup set um, under the Health and Wellbeing Board because some of the challenges and issues are a system-wide um, re response is required. And we had a really successful webinar last Friday, um, which was particularly focused at um, 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 reaching out to our BAME population. We had o over 80 attendees and it was co-produced with the local um, community. So I just wanted to, to, to note the fact that, that there is still work Work going on to, to progress this agenda across the wider system and within the council. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Council, Councillor Zada. Um, while, while, we, while I have this opportunity, there is a group of employees that you have got in this council that are excellent at working with this community and they're the bereavement team. And I think there are some lessons learned from those group of people who work and are able to work with the range of the community and, and, and co-produce and work together with them to sort some issues. From my, from my uh, professional life, I've had the pleasure of working very, very closely with them. And I think um, if there's any way that we can uh, recognize their work, because I think they're people that work behind the scenes, very little uh, fa you, you know, recognition, but the work that they do about tailoring their services to various different groups of the community in terms of their uh, ethnic and religious uh, requirements and their disability uh, requirements or whatever, you know, they're the groups that we should, that's the team we should listen, uh, listen to. And I just thought I'd use this opportunity to raise uh, to, to everyone on this call the fantastic work that those people have done during COVID uh, in, a, in a sort of a calm and collective way. Good point, very well made. Okay, no more contributions. Bell, thank you very much for that report. Recommendations are there on page 32. Are they all noted and accepted? Okay, thank you, colleagues. Moving on, um, not sure who's presenting this, possibly Matt Williams. Yes, indeed, leader. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. This is the, uh, the climate change emergency report. And uh, as you'll see from paragraph three of the report, um, according to the United Nations, the world may have just 10 years to prevent severe, widespread and irreversible climate change effects, uh, which obviously would be catastrophic um, and is a sobering thought. Uh, like many of our neighbours, um, we are looking at the approval of uh, a declaration of, uh, of climate change emergency. Um, this, um, this has been debated uh, at full council and um, it has also been uh, lobbied uh, by, uh, by others, as you'll see from uh, paragraph, uh, paragraph seven. Uh, I think it's important we took it. We talked earlier about ticking the box. And it is really important, I feel, that we don't just tick the box with this uh, climate change uh, report. Um, we should form a working group, a cross-party working group, uh, and develop a carbon reduction plan uh, with meaningful targets that are deliverable. Uh, in particular, those relating to the reduction of carbon emissions. This is very much, uh, Leader, uh, the start of a, a long journey. Um, we don't have all the expertise necessary to deliver this. We need to work with others. We need to set um, a baseline where we are now. 
We may need some external help to do that. And we also need to look at the horizon, what we could achieve as a local authority, uh, particularly authority like ours. Um, we are in a position to drive change from both within the authority and externally. And most importantly, we do have influence within our community. Um, if we get this right, we could lower energy bills, we could stimulate economic regeneration, and we could create local jobs. Um, we could create a reduction in fuel poverty, we could improve air quality, and we could provide a world with less floods, and we could maintain an infrastructure that's both affordable and deliverable. But if we get this wrong, then we're faced with extreme weather events, increased pollution, and energy inefficiency, not energy efficiency. Most importantly, the consequences of getting this wrong would hit our most disadvantaged groups the hardest, and that's something I think we need to be doubly aware of. As you can see from paragraph 10, a number of council functions that you'll all be aware of could uh, contribute to a possible solution. Um, transport and highways, um, the ability to work with different modes of transport and developing more public transport, waste and recycling. We're almost, uh, we're already making inroads where we could improve our recycling, uh, the use of single use plastics, etc. Uh, housing, we could build more energy efficient homes, uh, homes that don't uh, impact detrimentally on the environment. We could look at our own council facilities, um, we could develop a, um, a more co uh, energy efficient heating solutions uh, and green energy supplies. Uh, and our planning uh, team, again, they could look at new and existing de and developments uh, and look at ways of reducing uh, carbon emissions. So there are various ways uh, we could do uh, could influence uh, this, uh, this impending uh, uh, environmental crisis. We can't afford to also to, uh, to um, dismiss um, COVID-19. Um, it, it, no, nobody thank uh, thank you for it. Obviously, the effects of COVID-19 have been most terrible. However, there are advantages. Anybody who travels into uh, work will, will have noticed a, a decrease in traffic. Um, that has consequences. Uh, nitrogen dioxide levels are, are, are down, and that's something that we've been working on for some time. And again, we need to see that really and look at the opportunities that we have. Uh, at our disposal uh, and, uh, and not waste the current situation, not go backwards. Um, if you look at uh, paragraph 14, we've already done some consultation in relation to the development of a carbon reduction plan for Dudley. Uh, um, and there, you know, there's some things that we could certainly, a start of for 10, um, some things that we could look at from day one. Um, keeping our, uh, our solution local, uh, making uh, Dudley a biodiverse, natural and built environment, um, look at zero waste uh, and free, uh, and, uh, and, and free uh, single-use plastic, uh, and making us more sustainable um, and invest in, uh, in renewable uh, energy. So that's a starting point. Um, again, if you look at, um, if you look at paragraph 15, uh, we should perhaps give consideration to uh, develop a portfolio position to drive and champion climate change uh, and help the group deliver, uh, deliver our targets. And uh, I'll leave it at the leader. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. A very uh, in depth introduction. Uh, first hand raise is Councillor Chris Barnett. Uh, thank you, leader. Can I just check you can hear me? Cause I... We can. Oh, great. That's good. And uh, thanks, Matt, for uh, presenting that. that. That was good. Um, well, where I am with this, um, I, I obviously, as you might imagine, agree that Dudley should declare a climate change emergency at the earliest opportunity. I support the proposal, but uh, I can't 
honestly say that I uh, agree entirely with it. Um, uh, I do note, by the way, that the letters from uh, Hugh Burton and Stourbridge Friends of the Earth get a, get a, a mention, and uh, uh, I applaud both of them. Um, I know my own motion gets a mention, uh, but not by my name, um, but uh, not not Councillor Phipps either. So fair enough. Um, and do you know what? That's a thing. It's uh, that would kind of politicise an issue that really does transcend uh, partisan politics. And it's one issue that uh, one way and the other, sooner or later, we are all in this together. And um, so I am. Um, I'm a little I'm, I'm disappointed in the proposal a little bit in some ways because I feel it lacks ambition in in a couple of areas. Um, and uh, Councillor Fitch probably knows exactly what I'm going to say. And first of all, it lacks a target date and uh, by which we should achieve these zero carbon emissions. Now, I do appreciate the sense and the logic behind that. And um, we'd have probably had a conversation about it if we'd have had the chance. But anyway, um, I understand it was a key component of Councillor Phipps's amendment to my motion, um, but I think it's a, a mistake. Um, and I know um, and understand we might wish to scope out the width and the breadth of the issue and understand what time we need, what resources we need and how much it's all going to cost. Right, I thought uh, I could offer you a shortcut, a, a, a 10 second consultation for free. Right. I think we probably haven't got enough time. We haven't got enough resources and we haven't got enough money and that's the position we're in and it, it, it might not change an awful lot through it because it's such a massive thing to do um so for me setting the target date is a real emotional appeal to motivate the council and motivate dudley residents to uh, you know take notice and, and take some swift action and um you, you know I, I see sometimes leadership sees the value in setting emotional targets and uh, when Matt was talking there, it reminded me of what we, was, we were talking about um, uh, last week, where uh, we were talking about the call centre. And, uh, you, you know, our own leadership um, recognised that this call centre was crucial, crucial during COVID to keep it going. And so they said, right, you know, call centre, you need to go away and work from home immediately. Well, if we'd said that to them towards the end of last year, you can imagine it would have been, well, you know, we, we, we better have a think about that and scope it out and work out the width and the breadth of it and all that. We didn't have time to do that. Um, so clearly the call centre went home and they knew they were going to work from home and whatever reason they knew they were going to do whatever was needed to do. Now, the other thing that we did was we, we clearly, the leadership had belief in our ICT people. Um, and when I asked them and said, can, can you do this? And th the great thing was that, of course, the ICT people have probably been thinking about this for a decade. Yes, they could do it. They knew exactly how to do it. Um, they've, just, they've been sort of itching to do it. And sure enough, uh, Matt, Matt I'm, I'm sort of uh, maybe maybe making a bit of this up, but it seems to me that within a few days, it, it, they made it so, and that was it. Um, a seemingly impossible target. Um, the second thing I just want to mention is I, I do feel that the um, uh, this item or this proposal lacks uh, proper well lacks community involvement, and that was a key element in my original motion. I, I know that we've got these active groups in Dudley, so there's Friends of the Earth, one of them, Transition Stair, which is another. There are various others. Some of them are a bit political, some of them are less political. But within each of these groups, you know, there's individuals who they know a lot about what we need to do to rapidly and effectively address this this issue. And uh, I, I know there's officers as well who've uh, who have the same kind of uh, knowledge. And the reason they have that knowledge is they, they've been thinking about it for decades. You know, so, some of them that they've been involved in this kind of thing for the past 30 years now. Um, I think this proposal should really include those community groups at the real core of the action, not not just in a consultation, because sometimes I feel we do these consultations and they're not as effective as they could be. And I think in this case, Dudley Council uh, needs to be brave, show some really strong leadership, believe in the people that we have at our fingertips and actually give them a seat at the table while we do this thing. So uh, if I could just wrap up what Really, what I'm saying is uh, there's two things I'd like to see 
uh, amended, if we could, before this came to full council. So the first is, as you said, the UN advised that we uh, we might have 10 years uh, to prevent irreversible change. Well, it's 2020 this year. 10 years ahead is 2030. Uh, that, that's kind of where I got to with my motion. So I'd like to see that as a target. And um, the the climate, the, the, the council-wide cross-party climate change group, I'd like to see a way where we include full representation from members of the public and 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 action groups in in that group so they can probably have a seat at the table um thank you Lisa. thank you matt and i thank you thank you chris for that contribution okay i've got angus councillor lees uh yes thank you leader no hall hearing yep um i'm totally in support of reducing carbon emissions I think uh, I don't think we should do it alone, though, because it's a big agenda item uh, within the combined authority and all their projects, uh, transport, house building, etc. Um, the, 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 the GVA or the value add to the community is to reduce carbon emissions, special houses with, um, you know, solar panels on the side, different heating systems, gas, um, hydro and gas buses, etc. So it affects Metro, you know, VLR, new homes. Uh, and I think you've only got to look at lockdown to realise that carbon emissions in Dudley alone dropped by 20 percent. And that's a wake up call to me. And I think, you know, this this can be done. Typically, road transport contributes 37 percent. Domestic fuels, 28 percent and commercial fuels, about 32 percent. So it's across the board, domestic, commercial and transport. Um, this statement here in, in the uh, in the document is really only a declaration. And I think, um, you know, yes, we do have to set ourselves some objectives and timescales. I think the combined authority have made it 2040 as the year of trying to hit the target of zero emissions. Um, but an, an objective like that has to be realistically achievable. If you set yourselves objectives that are impossible, you fail. Um, and the limiter here. It's not the will of the people or the amount of people we can put into the project. It's the technology. That's what's going to make the change uh, and how quickly they can be developed. So I think we've got to put some thought uh, into how we go forward on this. But the, you know, the view of the, of the combined authority is post-COVID, where projects will need to be accelerated to save the economy. Uh, we may, you know, you can piggyback off that to maybe speed up um, meeting our emission targets, carbon emission targets. So those are just some of my views on, on uh, what you've just said. Thank you. Thank you, Angus. I've got Sue and then I've got Simon. Thank you, Leader. I, I just wanted to make a small comment. I, Matt said the lockdown has made a huge difference to uh, the pollution in the air. Many of you will be aware I've got COPD. So during lockdown, I've been able to actually have windows open at the front of our house because we live on a main road and with having so little traffic, it's actually fresh air that's come through the windows. But but just to say that, so I appreciate what was said about there. Perhaps we could uh, turn our attentions to um, parking outside schools, telling getting them to turn their engines off to reduce pollution. I know that's a, a big mountain to climb, but if we could, that would be really good. So thanks to Chris for all he said as well. I, I just have a question. Paragraph 13 says next steps, a number of action. I think before this goes to council, I think this should have some of those actions listed that we've got to do. The same as I, I do feel that it, where it says suggested the council invites and assesses staff suggestions and oversee engagement. How are we going to engage with the public? I think we need to see some of the meat on the bones there as to what we're actually going to do. Um, and that will make it, I think, far more acceptable for people. But this is something that we can't ignore. And I, and I think for our children's sake, I mean, if you if you go into a primary school, they'll tell you exactly how to, to do climate change. Um, well, you know, our grandchildren tell us they'll tell you not to use that plastic. Uh, I can't have any plastic uh, straws now. They'll say we, we are bamboo in this house. We have bamboo straws for the grandkids. So just to say, just some further 
clarification in that next step so we know what we get what we need to do thank you leader okay so thank you sue uh possible last word simon and if i look at paragraph 15 careful what you say because you may well talk yourself into this role <laughs> oh dear uh no actually i um <laughs> i would uh i would probably be quite um pleased if that was the case um if we do adopt the report or so on because um, it's one of the things that I've looked at and one of the um, areas that I've actually gone to the LGA um, to learn more about because it's something that I have taken an active interest in and working with some of the officers, uh, Matt and people in his team, Chris Jenkins being one of them in particular, the energy manager, there are some really good ideas around the authority um, and we've got, we've got, I think we've got a, 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 short, a small head start, um, although we do have a lot more work to do and I think that's detailed in the report that you know, there's quite a few actions that need to be forthcoming and more detail of those I'm sure can be provided. Um, I just want to say it's I'm quite pleased that actually has come to the first cabinet meeting after, um, you know, the start of the pandemic. So the first meeting there, we've been able to to sit down and, and, and discuss this um, to save sort of like delaying it any further, because it was unfortunate the the events that surrounded the last council meeting. So I'm glad that it's been brought forward now. As a council, definitely we are uh, lead, potential, we have the potential to be leaders in this field. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities in the future. Some of those have been highlighted to us because of COVID um, and the benefits. I think you know they've been touched upon already. Um, certainly, there's going to be obviously environmental benefits, but also with my other hat on, quite a lot of commercial benefits as well. Um, you know, if we look at uh, energy saving across the leisure centres, which is what we talked about earlier. Um, across all of our housing stock, I know that there is work on uh, on the on the agenda to make sure that all the, the housing boilers and things like that are upgraded. So there's quite a lot of opportunities um, throughout the council to be able to deliver on this and for us to to lead in the local community. Um, a couple of things I've mentioned, sort of like in response to some other points made. I think with the target date, it's something that is going to be set very soon anyway, and it might well be 2030. I personally prefer that we've got a little bit more knowledge and understanding before we set it. Um, but there's no problem with being ambitious uh, and you never know, you know, we might end up sitting in the discussion and saying, you know, two or three months time, we've looked at the, the work and we think that actually that's an ambitious but achievable target to do. So you never know, we might end up being at 2030 anyway. And finally, on, on the involvement of the public and, and special interest groups, I mean, whilst I agree that they certainly have a role to play and, you know, there is going to be uh, public outreach, I hope, on this issue, and I would um, certainly be expecting the council to be to be leading the public engagement and getting people involved, as as it says that we should be getting our staff involved in how to do this. But there is an element of, you know, this is a a council-led initiative, um, and the group will be made up of the council and certain key partners. Um, so if people want representation on things like that, there's a few ways to go around it. One is getting elected to Dudley Council uh, and the other is seeking that representation through the elected members of Dudley Council. So I'm sure that the members of those special interest groups will be able to make their voices heard through lobbying and representations to the members of that group, um, as is the right and proper way to do so, as you would find with I would say almost anything, anything that we do specifically. So that would be that would be my um, that would be my contribution. And uh, again, quite pleased that the report has been bought. OK, thank you, Simon. Uh, got the recommendations there on page 35. Are those accepted by members? Aye. Thank you all very much. Seeing all those thumbs coming up. Thank you. Agenda item nine, the mer men oh, memorandum of understanding with Avonbury. Uh, pages 41 to 43. Kevin, I think you actually signed this. Do you want to introduce it? It's, uh, Was it Jim? I it be, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Good evening. Everyone well. um, leader, this paper uh, sets out that the, the, the council should enter into a memor memorandum of understanding with Avon Bay Dudley Limited. Um, First of all, a, 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 a short apology from myself. I, I've worked in other councils in the Black Country where it wasn't the council, it wasn't a legal papers weren't, weren't appended to committee papers, and I thought that was I was led to believe that was the practice here. But I arranged this morning for copies of the uh, the actual memorandum of understanding itself to to be made available. And I think members have copies of those now. Um, 
as you look at the, the if you look at the main body of the paper, what it does is summarise the, 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 the what is in the memorandum of understanding. And I think the key message there is that as we emerge from lockdown and the impact of the the pandemic, it's vital that the council continues its, 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 to demonstrate its commitment to the regeneration of the borough. And a prime example of that is the um, the, the, the Portersfield development. And as we know, uh, while we were while we were in lockdown, the the, the Cavendish building was uh, eventually demolished, and that uh, is a, a real signal of intent to, to move on with the the development of the site. So the, the, the memorandum of understanding itself sets out the the protocols that we will use for, for taking forward any agreements with uh, Avon Bray Dudley uh, to support the funding and delivery of a development through uh, investigating a number of uh, funding schemes, including grants and funding agreements, and also sets out a protocol for communication uh, with the company. Uh, on approval of the memorandum of understanding, the next step will be to in, to invite uh, Avon Bray Dudley to submit detailed proposals to us as to what they want to see uh, on that site and for us then to carry out the appropriate due diligence on those proposals and bring uh, recommendations back uh, to future meetings of the Council as to how we should move forward. Okay, is that you done, Jim? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, just ahead of any potential questions on this, uh, obviously we'll sign this and then the next stage after that will be, as Jim's alluded to, it will go to the one of the scrutiny committees, possibly our review and scrutiny, uh, and then after that we'll come back to full council. So this whole project will have, I think, sufficient scrutiny, probably more than what we've done for any other key project. Um, I've got two now, like Kershid and then Shokat. Kershid. <clears throat> Councillor, you're on mute. I think you've lost your sound. Okay, so I get to show cap then, and then we can get probably Kershid back in a minute. You've cut him off in his prime. <laughs> do do Councillor Kershaw, do, do, do you want to um, come out and rejoin? Might uh, reset then. Yeah, he's gone. He's going to come back in. OK, then, show gaps. Off you go. Yeah, thank you, Leader. I mean, first of all, uh, I welcome the demolition of Cavendish House. Uh, as we know, over the years, uh, it has been uh, derelict, the building. Uh, it has become an eyesore. Uh, and, uh, you know, for a long time, people uh, in Dudley have wanted uh, this area to be regenerated. And sometimes it's also very frustrating for regeneration projects because they take such a long time to come to fruition and and i remember back in 2012 when i was cabinet member then uh, we had two different developers and we had to kind of sort out the complexities and the legalities around those and obviously uh, time uh, has moved on and then economic climate also changes i mean we started uh, with the likes of Morrison's or Asda, and you know we're now looking at a smaller uh, retail uh, development, uh, mixed-use retail development. Uh, I think that's been the emphasis uh, and and flow of uh, this particular uh, development uh, quarter. Um, and also, just to say that myself as ward councillor and my colleagues, councillor Steve Walter and Shanila Mughal, over the years uh, we have been more than flexible uh, you know to the developers we've uh, had regular meetings with with the developers and some of the outline plans where they are at the moment have been as a result of that in terms of the access from the bypass in terms of the residential uh, development because it started with retail and commercial and and leisure uh, and and then obviously you know we had to uh, uh, about 12 months ago, had to introduce the uh, the elements of uh, 
student accommodation and apartments to make the, the business uh, case stack up because what we want is we want this development, this regeneration to, to go ahead. Um, but I think the in terms of the actual memorandum of uh, understanding, my own feeling and belief is that there should be more substance to this. I mean, I've seen the document and thanks to Jim for sending that. Uh, and also, uh, I think the, the, the question uh, which, need, uh, which needs to be answered because this kind of underpins the whole kind of regeneration uh, and development of this area. And for the sake of, I think, openness and, and transparency, I have, you know, here, uh, and, you know, I don't know if you can see uh, an email from the former chief executive of this council who was leading, uh, you know, on, on, on this project. And uh, uh, as you will recall, there was a change in funding from the LEP uh, and, uh, you know, then going to the combined authority. Now, my uh, understanding and this uh, email confirms that the LEP offer wasn't agreed by the developers at the time because the conditions were too demanding uh, and in you know that the grant could be clawed back if the development didn't take place you know over a five-year period I mean personally I, I think I mean that kind of time scale is uh, you know was a reasonable and you know the combined authority of, uh, officer uh, sorry offer uh, it, it states that the, demol the, the demolition had less demanding conditions. So I think for for openness and transparency, I and I'm sure other colleagues would like to see what those conditions are, because the emphasis, uh, what I pick up from this report is now it's saying residential led development, which is a change from uh, the, the situation which was retail, commercial and leisure. That was the uh, you know, kind of uh, the project of this. And of course, I appreciate the climate has changed, but we have, as ward councillors, we have allowed sufficient uh, accommodation development as part of this uh, overall regeneration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your, uh, your comments, uh, Shokat. Um, you, you're absolutely right. Things have changed. And, you know, this scheme has to stack up. It has to pay for itself. Uh, and I don't think it will if it's predominantly led by retail. What we've just experienced over the last three months tells us that loud and clear. Um, I'll bring in Kershid back in. Yeah, thank you. And then, and then, and then, and then I've got Kada. Okay, thank you. Um, very new Um this has been very interesting. Lots of hard work has been done. Um, that, uh, it, 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 um, it, 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 Yes, yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for that, Leader. What I wanted to say is, firstly, I'm very disappointed that uh, at the last minute, somebody thought it was a good idea to send the memorandum of in understanding and, you know, assume that we will read it um, on the day of the Cabinet meeting. And I don't want us to be in that position again. I have read it. My worry is, what does it mean? Um, <clears throat> and I'd like somebody to explain does it actually mean anything? And can we hold to account? Uh, what I uh, have seen actually, some very difficult negotiations with the um, this, this particular organization. And actually after every hurdle, they put another one forward. And I'd like to know whether this memorandum of understanding means that we can work with them in a much more reliable and productive way um, because this particular scheme has uh, <clears throat> outgrown many leaders and I appreciate that we now don't have to look at Cavendish House. But I want to be sure, um, and I'd like uh, Jim Cunningham to look me in the virtual eye and tell me that we will be able to now hold this particular 
company to uh, task to deliver this regeneration? Or is this memorandum of understanding just not worth the paper it's written on? Jim? I think you, you, Councillor Zara, you hit the nail on the head there when you talked about moving forward in a reliable and productive way. And I think that's what we, we, we want to do through the memorandum of understanding. Quickly move, uh, we, 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 we get an understanding of the proposals into a period of due diligence and then bring recommendations uh, back to the Council. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kirshen, I'll bring you in and then I'll finish off on this subject. Nida, can I come back on this? Yeah, yeah, of course you can. Um, uh, you know, I know Councillor Fick said we should all get elected and I think Jim should be the next person who goes for a political seat because he's absolutely avoided the question I asked him. So I'll ask him again, will this enable us to hold Avonbury to account? It's a very simple question, yes or no? Yes, I would hope. Yes. Well, and it's, yes, and it's, no, I'm not interested in your hope, Jim. I'm interested I think, in this I think, it, I, think, I, th I think he just answered that. He said yes. And, and then he is, said, I yes. hope. This is means... part of that process of having that long term relationship with a major developer. And it's this administration that's worked extremely hard at building that relationship and making sure that we get over the finishing line first with the demolition of Cavendish which was going nowhere under civil administrations, but it was thanks to a Tory council, a Tory Metro mayor, that we have got this horrid building demolished and off the The next stage now, Kedda, is yeah. to move this project forward exactly. rather than continue to talk about it for and another... And that's why I'm saying, years. Councillor Harley, that's exactly why I am saying to you, can we do it with this memorandum of understanding? Yes, we I'm can. Not, yes, and I'm it sends out. It sends out rather than some of the negativity that we sometimes get from your shadow cabinet members. This memorandum sends out a very positive message that after COVID, we are hell bent on regenerating this town centre and this borough, and it sends out a really positive message, not just. Uh, from ourselves in Avonbury, but more importantly, to other developers who may want to come here and spend money in Dudley, Halzo, in Stairbridge and Brawley Hill. So that's a yes then, Councillor Harley. It's, it's from me, Councillor Zardy, yes. That's all I'm interested in. Thank okay. you. Okay. Kersha, did you want to come back in? Yeah. Thank you, Leader. That's um, better. Brilliant. No, this is great. Um, yeah, great work. Nice to see that it's down. Um, well done to everyone uh, for the hard work. Just a few contradictions. I'm concerned about this memorandum of understanding. Contradiction, firstly, is that uh, it says that in paragraph three uh, the develop, that the council has developed partnership with Avonbury, okay, uh, Dudley Limited. And then in the memorandum itself, we say that we are not part of a partnership. I'm just talking about the legalities here. We've just got to be careful, uh, Leader, that we, we just don't... And, 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 and I'll take on board that, that those comments, Kershid, but if I bring you back to what I said at the start of this, I signed this, we signed this memorandum of understanding with Abram Reed. They then come back with far more detailed plans. Those plans will not just come to Cabinet. Sure. The 10 senior members of the Tory party to approve them. They will go to the most powerful scrutiny committee that we have on this authority, then they will come back to cabinet and then full council. No, I just appreciate it. What, what I what complete yeah. transparency. Oh, brilliant. I'm just trying to understand is that once you sign off a document, then that's a legal document, isn't it? And why it's would he? Level of understanding. Yeah. The detail is yet to come, Urshid. Yeah, but it's just a few other things that I just want you to bear in mind before that. I mean, that's one of the points that I've raised. The other one is that if you look at uh, paragraph 6.2, for example, for it to be for any party to terminate it by giving 12 months notice, a long period of time when we want everyone to move quickly. So if there are any things to be done, and uh, you know we find a block wall or something, we want things to be done quickly rather than this kind of time. Personally. I would have done it differently. I would have said now, let's go through the document, uh, you know, uh, cross party wise, see what the issues are, 
and then come back to the cabinet. But obviously, you're minded to do it the other way around, and that's because there's top quite a lot of things there that I don't really understand, and we need to have full details before we should sign this memorandum of, of understanding. But obviously, it's it's your call, you're the leader, and if that's the way that you like, then fine. But there are a lot of misleading information in there. That needs to be corrected beforehand. I don't think it's misleading at all. I think it's extremely clear, and we're not going to have more dither and delay. We are having, we are coming out of this pandemic in this borough, and we are going to, as the Prime Minister has said, build, 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 and we'll build our way out of the mess that this pandemic has left, not just this borough, but the entire country. And it's full speed ahead. Okay, then, colleagues, the recommendations are on page 41. Is that agreed? Okay, thank you. What a marathon session this has been. Uh, number 10, to report on any issues arising from scrutiny committees. There are none, Lita. I think there's only been about two committee meetings. <laughs> oh, I hope there wasn't. Uh, thank you for that. And number 11, to consider any questions from members to the leader where two clear days notice has been given to the monitoring officer. Again, okay, none, leader. Okay, well, can I thank colleagues? It's been a long session. But, uh, it's been a good one. Um, I, 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 I dread to think what full council will be like using uh, these measures, but uh, it'll be entertaining uh, to say the least. But thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.